Hello, everybody. This is Damian Sneed. And tonight we will focus on creatives in television and film from Augusta to Hollywood. This is the fifth episode of Damian Sneed Dialogues. I want to thank you all personally for tuning in each Tuesday evening. And also for those of you that watch on demand on YouTube and Facebook. Tonight, please share because this is a very special episode. I'd like to introduce my first guest. I usually read a bio about each person, but tonight in the format, I'm going to have each person talk about their careers themselves. Our first person coming on is Shannon Baker Davis. Can we all greet Shannon? Say hello, Shannon. Hi, thank you for having me. And then our next person is Shay Roundtree. Say hello, Shay. Hi, what's up, everybody? How you doing? Awesome. So this is a very, very special episode because we have some of my closest friends. I'd really like to say that this group is like a tribe for me, a tribe to me. They're like family. I've personally known each of you for over 30 years. <laughs> oh, wow. I to calculate the time. And <laughs> I really say, that is really special because I'm extremely proud of both of you. Uh, I've had a carte blanche uh, seat. I've been very close to watch both of you uh, at a very early, early age. Uh, Shannon, I remember our first <laughs> class together in uh, Mrs. Rogers' English class in the portable at Davidson. And Shay, I remember, uh, I think the first time we met was, well, I know I'd seen you a lot of times at church, but the first time that Some, we met um, was- Sunday oh, school. Um, yeah, the youth conference. Yeah, the youth conference. The youth conference, but also the Delta Sigma Theta sorority uh, mm -hmm. competition for, they called it oratory at that time. Yeah. Yeah. We were doing spoken word and things like that. What was very interesting, everybody, this group of uh, panelists for this evening is very special to me. I won't be emotional. I know the older I get, I get very emotional. But uh, every time I come to Los Angeles, California, they support me, whether it's at the Hollywood Bowl with Diana Ross, whether it's a concert, my tour, or just getting together or having a bite to eat uh, at a restaurant, they always support. And I definitely appreciate that. In Georgia, we have a way of saying that someone is your homeboy or homegirl. These are my uh, home, this is my homeboy, my homegirl. But Shannon and Shay, they're both like family to me. I told them the last time we were together, because my mother is no longer here, uh, you know, other than my aunt and a few other people in Augusta, I don't really have a tribe or a family that can remember Damien back in fifth grade. Like, oh, Shay, I forgot about the play we did when teachers go nuts. Because the mini But you know, stories right. like that. Uh, uh, times with Shannon, you know, at Davidson, as we were both growing uh, and learning, and Shay, of course, you know, at Beulah Grove Baptist Church and Good Shepherd Baptist Church and T.W. Josie High School. But these people really know me well. They've known me before there was a platform like this, before I personally uh, had a chance to work with artists that were of note or people like that, or before I really became a performing artist myself. So tonight, instead of reading their bios, I just wanted to express from my heart how appreciative I am to both of them. And I really, really appreciate it because uh, in this entertainment industry, one of the things that you've heard us speak about in previous episodes is the notion of community and family. And it's extremely important uh, that you have balance and that you also have people that can keep you in check and that can uh, be a place where you can just be yourself. Because a lot of times if you don't have that in this industry of ups and downs and peaks and valleys, without that, you really can't, uh, be able to remain strong and have the fortitude and the creative energy that it takes to be the best that you can be. So I appreciate you, Shay. I appreciate you, Shannon. So people are very interested. I know we have some of our classmates watching and some of our <laughs> teachers and family members watching from Augusta, Georgia. So I'd like to ask both of you, and I'll start with you, Shannon. Could you tell us how you came to be in your present career field, how you started off? I am a, a television and film editor. Um, and for those that don't know what an editor does, they shoot the picture and an editor is responsible for putting it together according to the script and then taking it to the next level. Um, 
a lot of editors like to say we're the last rewrite of the script. So um, an editor is really important. Um, a lot of people don't even know that the shows and the films that they watch are cut together. So, and I know when I learned that, I was like, I was blown away and, that, and that, that's what I want to do. So I started, went to Davidson Fine Arts with Damien and um, from like fifth grade to 12th grade, we were classmates. And so I knew all along that he was very talented and and we also went to Howard University together and he just blew up on the music scene and I've just sat and watched him get, you know, everything that he said he was going to do. And I think that's really important is to have goals and to go for them. And I uh, came out of Howard with a radio TV film degree. I worked for a year at a post-production house in DC and then decided to go back to school at AFI in LA, out here in LA where I live now. And um, just worked my way up, got out of AFI, moved actually to New York and got into reality television and edited that for 10 years and then moved to LA and wanted to get into scripted and um, found that it was tough to make the move from unscripted to scripted. And it took me five years to talk to enough people and beg enough people to give me a shot um, mm -hmm. before I got a job on The Good Wife on the seventh season of The Good Wife, which was the last season as an assistant editor. I actually went back to assistant assisting and just soaked in everything that my editor could tell me about the scripted workflow and, you know, what the editor editor's role on a scripted show was and, you know, talking with the producer and, you know, talking with the director and coming to a final product and, you know, just went from there and went to, on to edit um, a show on BET called The Quad. That was my first scripted editing job and um and i it i gravitated towards that show because i had gone to a black college it was about a black college it's about the marching band i had danced um at howard as a bisonette and um it just felt right and proceeded to do other shows um on i went to queen sugar i did Grownish, the first season of Grownish, where I met Stella McGee, who is a director and she had directed feature films and she was going on to direct The Weeknd, which I cut for her, and The Photograph, which I recently worked on, that was in theaters when the pandemic hit. So, um, and it is on, um, on, on VOD right now and all the digital platforms and I also just cut a show called Black AF, hashtag Black, Black AF, that's on Netflix. And that's where I am now. I'm, I'm home with my kids and my family and my husband and my kids. And we're just riding this out till production starts up again. That's amazing because it was you and another classmate of ours, Jacqueline Bimpa. We went to school from 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, wow. rest of the year. Sophomore year, junior year, and senior year at Howard University. We were together mm. a very, very long time. <laughs> a very long time. Yeah. I know all at Damien C. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh. We were in the same, <laughs> I'll never we were in the same dorm, too, in the towers. Yeah. So it's really funny because every time I would uh, enter the towers, Shannon was exiting the towers. Like we'd pass our, our calls. <laughs> back. Every time I was like getting on the elevator, Shannon was like getting off the elevator, right? It would happen like almost I, all the time. I, well, it was I, crazy. And we were also country bumpkins in DC. <laughs> so we didn't know what to do with ourselves. Like, exactly. I, I mean, Howard is my heart. Howard taught me the love of blackness. Howard mm -hmm. taught me how to survive in the world. It was just an experience that I treasure and I hope that people consider black colleges when they 
when they talk about what school to go to, what school is going to make you a better person, not necessarily oh, academically, mm-hmm. but just what school is going to nurture you and guide you and have a network. Like, I don't know, I don't know how other schools are, but my Howard network to this day, and I'm not going to tell you how many years it's been, mm-hmm. but to this day is the backbone of a lot of things that I do. So definitely that's a feel for Howard. And Shay, can you tell us how you came to be in your present career field? Oh, man. Um, well, I guess for me, it, it all kind of started at church, at um, Beulah Grove Baptist Church, where I got involved in um, doing Easter and Christmas plays and, you know, different skits. And um, my mom took me to see a, a play that the Augusta Mini Theater put on called My Dream at the Imperial Theater when I was a kid. And got a chance to meet the cast after the show and um she just asked me right then and there was that something i w- would be interested in doing and um she enrolled me in the gusta mini theater so that's how i got into you know form formally got into acting and um i loved it and it's something i never outgrew and i continued to do it throughout middle school throughout high school um when i got to college in atlanta um i went to clark atlanta university um the other the other HBC university <laughs> <laughs> um, where I had a chance to work with um my mentor two of my mentors were um well really three it was um JW Lewis um Ms. Lewis she actually taught in Augusta Georgia at TW Josie her husband was stationed in Fort Gordon but she went on to teach people like um Spike Lee Bill Nunn Lynn Whitfield Rolanda Watts um these Kenny Leon, Carol Mitchell Leon, these are all people that came from her and I had a chance to, you know, be able to study with her. And um, of course, Carol, the late Carol Mitchell Leon, you know, also Mr. Lewis has passed away. And um, my other mentor was um, um, Whitman Mayo, better known as Grady from Sanford and Son. Um, so those are the three people who, when I was in college, inspired me to really branch out um, and start doing things professionally in the city of Atlanta. And so, you know, I started doing everything in Atlanta. I worked at the Alliance Theater. I was doing a children's show about AIDS prevention that toured over across the state. I worked as a character for the Atlanta Braves, and I was doing programs at every church, new birth, you know, city, you know, just everywhere. And um, when I ran out of things to do in Atlanta, um, well, let me stop. Let me stop. Let me go back because it's almost the same thing that happened with Shannon. My f- I'm doing all the local stuff I could do in Atlanta. And my big break came when uh, with the movie Drumline. A lot of people um, probably remember me from Drumline. I played the character Big Rob, um, was upperclassman, who was taken up for Nick Cannon, the whole movie. But um, Drumline came about, you know, I was auditioning for all the local day player roles in the city. And the <laughs> vice president, um, Charles Stone and Christian Kaplan, um, our, lead, our leadership panel um, for um, the casting director, they saw something in me and they wanted to offer me a bigger role. So I ended up getting a supporting role in the film. And that's how my trajectory towards Hollywood started. And um, after I did that, I moved to L.A. and I was here for about two weeks and ended up getting a TV show on NBC. And I just been working, doing commercials, films here and there. I ventured into writing and comedy. And so that's that's a, that's the quick version of my story. Wow, that is absolutely amazing. Uh, you know, we are definitely uh, Southern people. Yes. I'll, say I'm country. I'll say I'm definitely country. Uh, and, you know, we grew up on Southern cooking. Mm-hmm. We grew up in a city uh, that was diverse, yet still felt the tinges of racism. Uh, and we also grew up in a city where our community, uh, our environment really pushed us to become the best that we could be. Um, Can you all tell me, usually I just ask the panelists to discuss one to two of the defining moments of their life or career thus far. And you all have already told us about uh, your first sort of uh, opening into Hollywood, the quad, which I did watch as well. And then also drumline that I watched, but maybe I'd like to shift a little bit. Maybe you can tell us one defining moment that has to deal with your career uh, since you made it to Hollywood, perhaps, or a film or someone you got to work with. 
But I would love it if you could tell me what defining moment can you remember from Augusta, Georgia, mm -hmm. whether it be nursery time, elementary school, uh, well, we called it kindergarten, as they say, or pre-K, even you remember that, middle school, high school, a teacher, a moment, uh, some extracurricular activity, something on a bus, a sports game, something with your parents or your your you know family members. To, to give us both, uh, and I'll let you go go first, Shannon. Since uh, going back and forth, now. so two defining moments: one in your career, yes, like shifted, but something that you really can remember. You like to tell those watching, yeah. Um, I mean, I think. Just going to Davidson was a big deal. Um, <laughs> and, you know, that was a lot of years. But I, I remember being, because I was a, um, when I got to high school, cause in middle school, I played the viola and I did all these things. And I was very, very busy doing all different kinds of things. And I decided I wanted to just concentrate on dance. And I remember, um, I remember getting a lot of freedom to create. And that's kind of a big deal when you're 12 or 13 or 14, um, that we had, you know, we, I think it was our either our junior or senior year, we choreographed our, oh God, my computer is we choreographed our, um, like our P, our final piece, and we did a step show. And Davidson had never seen a step. I remember that. Like, they did not. They didn't know what that was. We were like, okay, we're going to tell you. I mean, we barely knew what it was because stepping was just getting, you know, coming to the forefront um, through, you know, sororities and fraternities. And I remember that was, it was a big deal because we got to introduce a form of dance to our entire school community. And we felt the pressure and we did, we worked really hard and we choreographed that whole thing. And we were like stepping in the stands and I just remember it was so much fun. And uh, that I would say for as a creative, being a creative force rather than just always being told you're gonna put on this play or you're going to sing this song or you're gonna play this piece in the orchestra that when we got to say, we're gonna do this and we created it and we did it that was, it's, that's liberating for, you know, a young person. Um, you know, we didn't have TikTok and all that stuff where, you know, <laughs> they're creating out every day. On my face. You know, amazing. <laughs> right. We didn't have that. We had to, you know, we were taught performance is, you know, on a stage and it mm -hmm. is in front of your peers and it is being mm -hmm. respectful of that space both on the stage and if you're sitting in the audience just watching and listening. So that was a lot of our upbringing. And now it, the performance is on a global level. And so I just can't imagine growing up knowing that you can put something out there and millions of people will see it. So, um, yeah, that was a big deal. I, you want to do career or you want to go to Shay and then come back? <laughs> Let's no, go to we'll, Shay. No, no. Oh, yeah, okay. We'll oh, go to okay. For Augusta, yeah. Um, like for me, like for me, it was crazy. Just, um, just, just first of all, just as a performer and entertainer, um, there's a musician um, in my home church that goes by the name of um, his name is Millage Cotter the Third. The Millage Cotter. The Millage Cotter. The maestro. Majorly. Wow. And growing up watching him direct the choir and and play that's what inspired me to want to be a performer. So actually I got into music first. I started playing the violin. I used to actually play in all county with Shannon. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, you know, I played um, alto saxophone, baritone horn, tuba, trumpet, um, trumpet mostly. Um, I played, you know, in the band all the way up until from middle school to high school. And then, you know, that's when I got involved with the mini theater and uh, my band director at um, high school gave me an ultimatum one day. He told me that, you know, you can either be in the band or you can act. You can't do both. Mm. And because, you know, I was a rebellious kid. And so I'm like, all right, screw you. So I put my horn on a chair, walked out, and I never went back to band until I got ready to do drum line. So now I'm immortalized in band forever. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so that was a defining moment that pushed my tra trajectory and me really wanting to try to succeed 
at becoming an actor because at that point in my life, almost everybody I knew, every single person that I knew back home didn't believe it was possible. Hmm. Wow. You know? Amazing. So, Shannon, what was the defining moment? Of <laughs> I'm sorry, I mean, it like that, but it means yeah. it like, I'm just keeping Everybody, it This is my brother, Shay Rowley. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, if I was said I wanted to be a singer. therapy right now. It's different. If I was a singer, it's different. If I said, you know, I want to be a singer, because everybody could reference James Brown. So that was easy, but you're talking about doing movies and being on TV. That At that time, that was something that was unheard of. You know? Yeah. Especially for a kid coming from Augusta. Very true. Very true. Yeah. yeah. And Augusta really should highlight the fact that someone from uh, Augusta, from an Augusta high school, uh, from an Augusta church, from the community of Augusta, has gone on to do all the things that you've done. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. Shannon? What would yes. you say is a defining moment of your career or a turning point or something that really stands out? I think, um, you know, like I said, I worked in New York in reality, moved to LA, like I'm gonna get into scripted and scripted television and film. And, you know, I was like steady networking, networking, networking and getting like great reality shows, Top Chef, Runway. I was just, I was doing really well. You were on a dating show too. You were like, you were one, of, one of your friends was dating some guy or blind date. I don't think you're talking right now. I don't think you're talking right now. <laughs> <laughs> you're in the limo? Like, yeah, okay. uh oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Is it on YouTube? Wait, wait, you wanna, stop spit? You wanna start spilling tea? Oh, wait, 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 wait. No, 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 no. Um, so <laughs> I was on a show called the X Factor, I think it was called, the X something. But I had met this guy, oh my God, I can't believe I'm talking about this. I had met this guy at a bar or something and we you know, started talking. And then he was like, well, I'm going on this dating show and I need two ex-girlfriends. I don't want to use my real ex-girlfriends. So, and the whole premise of the show was that a guy went on a date while his two ex-girlfriends watched and commented and made him do silly stuff on the date. She's an actress as well, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> so, but he he was smart. He was like, I'm not using my real ex-girlfriends. So <laughs> I I said, okay, I'll do it. That's fine. Awesome. Never heard from again. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, um, so when I was <laughs> working, <laughs> y'all stop. All right. So low, so low. <laughs> I'm gonna be good. I'm gonna be good. That was funny though. Um, so when I was working in reality and um steady, like getting more jobs and more jobs, um, and it was hard to say, no, I'm not gonna do any more, not gonna take any more jobs and and you know, not work until I can get a scripted job. And I had my first daughter, or my only daughter, my our first kid. And um, I came off of maternity leave to cut this film called Armstrong for my two friends, Carrie and Nick. Um, and they were directing and we had been talking about me editing their film as a feature film, narrative feature film with like action, sci-fi. It was like right up my alley. And so I came off maternity leave like about three months and cut that film for them and loved it so much. And I was like, this is what I want to do. I want to be in the room, in the chair, making, cutting movies, working with VFX, working with the composer, work doing, this is where I am meant to be. And went on to do another reality show after that was finished and was on that job like, uh, get me out of here. So, and up until that point, I was always the person on a reality show that was like, dig in, fix the scenes, fix the show, help out this person, stay late, come in early to try to make the show good. And on that job, I was like 10 to seven, I'm out. Don't ask me for anything else. You know, I did my work. I got out of there because I had to get home to, you know, my daughter, 
Mm -hmm. and my family and that was what was most important and i decided on that job if i was going to be away from my family it was going to be for something that i love to do mm -hmm. and that pretty much that by the end of that year i said no more reality jobs and i didn't work for like two or three months and then i got the job on the good life so mm -hmm. it i mean it was hard it's, it's a decision to make with your whole entire family too yeah that so i love it how yeah. both of you all include your your spouses and your two children both of you okay. have uh, uh boy and girl shay your son is the oldest shannon mm -hmm. your your daughter's the oldest yeah your yeah. son is the youngest shannon and shay your daughter's the youngest yeah i just love yeah. that i love family yeah. i mean it's a big it's a big part of your life like how can it not be and and you know shay can talk to this from an actor's point of view but it's 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 hard to balance you know working Very. Long hours, sometimes going on location, um, and just being tired and stressed. And your work is your whole. I mean, even now while we're home and production is shut down, part of my identity is <laughs> right. And so yeah. that's been hard too. Is to say, okay, what can I do to be creative? What can I do to feel like I'm still contributing to this part of my right. identity? And um, so it's it's a lot. Like the work life balance is always something that I'm always people are like. How do you do it? And I'm like, day by day. Like mm -hmm. I still don't know. I still haven't figured it out. I don't know that anybody has figured out how to make it perfect in their life. Right. Definitely. Well, for me, <laughs> people to work moments, man. I got stories for you. <laughs> It's, I mean, I don't where you want me to go. I mean, I got stories, man. Like, this I've had so many. One highlight, one one highlight that that um, the I'll biggest highlight. I feel like the biggest highlight of my life, and I don't tell this story because people have read me write about it, but they've never seen me talk about it. You know, face to face. Mm. And it was the night I got invited back to Paisley Park, and I got my yeah. own private jam session with Prince. I um I was doing a show. So right after I left school, um, I got a um, job doing a gospel play with uh, Michael Matthews, and um, I was Michael one, Matthews. He Michael Matthews. Um, he was the one that started that whole thing. Um, um, the cast was um, Ollie Woodson um, from The Temptation and Late Ollie Woodson. Uh, you guys probably know him from the song "Treat Her, Treat Her Like a Lady." Um, Ralph Tresvant from New Edition. He played my younger brother, um, Christopher uh, Martin, um, play from Kid and Play, um, played my brother, Quan Howell, um, the Quan Howell from Sounds of Blackness, um, played my brother, and um, Bernadette Stannis, Thelma from Good Times, was my fiance in the show. Keep so that was like my first big like gig, you know? And um, we toured all over the United States for about six months and we went to Minneapolis and I had a friend that was in Minneapolis and was like, yo, I'm doing children's theater in Minneapolis. Yo, when you get here, I'll show you around. I was like, cool. And so she was like, yo, I know how much you love Prince. You know, I went to a party at Paisley Park. I'll show you where it's at if you want to see it. So I'm giving a quick version of the story. <laughs> and so she drives me out to Chanhattan, Minnesota because it's actually not in Minneapolis. And um, in the middle of this like, cornfield you just see like this white building with the purple lights and it's just like man i am like standing in front of paisley park prince's place right and so i got out the car took a couple of pictures got back in and we're leaving and she said something had she not made this comment the rest of the story would have never happened but she said hmm i'm surprised the gate is open it's usually closed and I looked at her and was like, turn around. She was like, why? I said, well, drive in. You say the gate <laughs> is usually closed and open, open for wow. a reason. And she's like, what you going to do? I said, I'm going to get out and go in and introduce myself. What you think? Oh, wow. So she pulls up. Ebony wow. Perry, she can vouch for this. So she pulls up. I get out the car. I go right in the doors of Paisley Park. There's like three people waiting for Prince and a security guard. Security stops me. He asks me, you know, who am I? And I get real professional. It's like, how you doing, sir? My name is um, <laughs> I'm here. I'm doing a show at the um, Orpheum, you know, downtown. And um, I want to get a tour of the facility if it was possible, you know, for future <laughs> projects. That's what I said. It was it was crap, but it was what I spewed. So um, 
He was like, well, the lady that handles that isn't here right now. And I said, man, our tour buses are pulling out in the morning. This is the, We got a show tonight. This is the only time I have. Can I, you know, check it out? And he was like, I'll be right back. So he goes to the back. And then come down to the staircase to the left of me. I say, Prince. And he's walking towards me. And I squeeze my gluteus maximus. <laughs> hard as I could trying to keep my composure and remain cool. And he wow. walks up to me. He looks at his gas. He looks at me. He looks at his gas. He said, what's going on? And I said, <clears throat> the same spiel. How you doing? I'm Shay Roundtree. I'm here doing a show. Wow. And then security comes like, man, you got to go. You got to go. And I said, let me just finish, man. I said, hey, man, come to my show tonight. I'll leave tickets for you at will call. That's what I told Prince. And so security pushed me out the door and we left. And so we go do a show that night. It was crazy. We had a great show, man. Johnny Gill's in the house. Janet wow. Jackson was in the house. And um, we go to a nightclub later that night. And I, I, at that point in my life, I really wasn't a club person. I'm more of a lounge kind of person. So I like to sit back and watch people watch because I'm short and guys get disrespectful to short dudes in the club. And, you know, <laughs> confrontation. I just find me a wall or a cut just to sit back. So I'm in the VIP and I'm just sitting back chilling. The exit door opens up. Something happens, but I'm watching girls on the dance floor. And the guy that was with me was like, yo, man, Prince just came in the VIP. He went upstairs to the DJ booth and Prince went to the DJ booth and he DJ for about an hour or so. And so and then after he finished, he left out the same way he came in. Then his bodyguard came back and was like, he's having a private party tonight at Paisley Park. And he couldn't make it to your show, but you're welcome to come back tonight and hang out. And you can bring some of your cast members with you. What? Yeah. Wow. And so I'm like, for real? He was like, yeah, just got, you need this bracelet to get past security, the gate. So I'm trying to get people to come with me. Nobody wouldn't believe me. Two cast members believe me. So it's like, now how are we going to get there? There was no Uber then. And then, so there was this one guy who was a friend of one of my, my cast members, and he was like, um, you put some gas in it, you can drive my car. <laughs> I'm like, for real? He's like, if you put some gas in it, I don't care. And then I'm like, okay. So this stranger literally gives me his car. And because my friend took me there earlier, I remember how to get there. And we drove there, man, and we ended up staying. Wow. Matter of fact, it was probably about eight, nine o'clock when, when we left, and my tour bus was you know, like in 45 minutes. So I just literally ran to the hotel. And man, we jammed. I got a chance to sing with Prince on stage, and it was only like what? eight people, and he put on a full personal concert for us. What? Wow. So that's so that's my story. I'm sorry, but that's, that's a funny moment. Anybody knows me, you know, I've been a Prince fan since I was a kid. My first concert was Prince when he came to Augusta. With Roger and Zap, so I was seven years old, and I told him that that night, and you know he got a kick out of it. But you know that's one that's my favorite story, man. That is a story. Wow, bro. <laughs> Jennifer faints. <laughs> of course. Woo! Wow, this is this is crazy. Let me um, call my mom from his office too. My mom was at work; she was working nights then. Wow, you know I see we have so many uh, wonderful people from Augusta. That are online, uh, Shallon from Davidson, Keith Rick from Davidson. Uh, I see Tanya Bell and also Karen Gordon. Uh, their brother, Wycliffe Gordon, is very responsible yeah. for me meeting Winton. That's they're, they're all family to me. Wow, Meredith, yeah, yeah it's the Meredith, man. Meredith, oh, Meredith. Well, I haven't seen Meredith in so long. Um, wow, we have a special year coming up uh, next year, don't we, Shannon? <laughs> You know, for high school. Oh, did you have to say it out loud? <laughs> oh, that's cool. I'm not ashamed of it. <laughs> right, right, sure. Right, right. It's hard to hide. It's hard to hide. Right. hide. We're all, we're all over the internet. Right. If people want to know, they can find out. Exactly. Yeah. I don't, uh, I don't know what y'all are talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because we all graduated at the same time, everybody. You're right, Meredith. We're not that old. We're just seasoned and experienced. <laughs> I'm a stock. <laughs> so this is this, this actually leads me into my next uh, question. I know I asked you about defining moments, but tell me how significant, in your own words, was growing up in Augusta, Georgia, in your development as a creative in film and television. I'll go first because I don't want us to be accused of you know trying to continue the paradigm of patriarchy 
and you know, and always asking Shannon to go first. Right. <laughs> I'll, I'll start off. Man, Augusta was pivotal. I, everything that I have, everything I accomplished, the things about my personality that people like about me is all of because of where I grew up. That's, that, <laughs> that's my, because Augusta is a very unique place because Augusta is like too big to be country country, but too mm-hmm. like small to be real city. So mm-hmm. it's like, you know, Augusta is its own thing. You know, it's like, it's a lot of poverty and it's a lot of wealth all concentrated. And so I would say growing up in the CSRA really gave me a very balanced view, you know, a microscopic view of the world at large. And so learning some of the power structures and just dynamics and just, you know, having to survive and grow up in a city like that, going out into the world, my expectations in a sense were not as high as they should be for probably some other people coming from somewhere else. And I think because of that, that's what just helped me push through, you know? You know, it's funny. A lot of my friends now say uh, that I should be a comedian. It reminds me of my mother. My late mother, mm-hmm. she would always say that I should have considered being a comedian as my, you know, second career path. But, you know, Shay, you know, it's we got to of that stuff from church, <laughs> watching people in church, you know, the characters, you know, people just are characters. And Shannon, you know, at Davidson, we were always <laughs> cracking up about something. I don't even want to call certain classes and certain teachers, but you know, oh look, Tasha, Tasha uh, Greer Jones just said yes. You know, we were always <laughs> laughing. I, I think that's one thing about Augusta people. Uh, everybody sort of has a personality, and they have a sense of humor, and they're also very knowledgeable about something as well. Uh, we always grew up knowing that just because someone is quiet, it doesn't mean they're not aware, present or that they're knowledgeable about stuff. Right. Um, Shannon, tell me for you, what was significant growing up in Augusta, Georgia with your development, you think, as a creative in film and television? I mean, I I got, well, it's hard to say because there I, there's no access to behind the scenes. You mm. grow up in Augusta, just mm. like, hey, you grow up <laughs> in Augusta, you are going to either go to Augusta State or UGA, and you're going to go into engineering or, or teaching or medical. Or medical. Teaching, teaching medical engineering. That's yes, You know, and it it it's you know not that people don't do other things, but you know it's very limited in a world type of um, view, and you know going to Davidson, that's a little bit less so because we are just. You know, like we were the weird kids in mm-hmm. in Richmond County, and so we were just like open to, you know, different types of people and different worldviews, and you know, and so that helped me have an open mind about things. And I think just Augusta, you know, because I decided I went to a summer program at Northwestern my junior between my junior and senior year of high school. And that is where I decided I was going to do something in television and film. And my parents pro- were like, what? Because uh, my mom is a nuclear chemist. My dad is an electrical engineer. My sister is a biochemist. Um, so it, it, was hard. it was hard to convince them that I could do it and make a living and, you know, get off the, the payroll, the parents' payroll, because they were worried about that. And um, I think that, you know, growing up in that environment also mm-hmm. gives you independence from mm-hmm. that environment. It's a, it's a weird thing too, because, you know, you could, I think going to Davidson gave me an idea that you could do things differently. Mm-hmm. So that is a part of me still to this day. Like when people are like on a on a show or a film, you know, let's do this. And I'm like, I don't know if that's the best way. You can always right, right. you can always do something different. You can always make your mark. And um I think that's what is, you know, from Augusta. Cause I I just had no exposure to film and television. So I don't know where I got that from. Maybe mm-hmm. watching TV. Maybe growing up in Augusta, where my parents worked at the mm-hmm. at the Riverwatch plant at the Westinghouse 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. They left the house at like 6 a.m. and they didn't get back to like 6 p.m. So I grew up watching a lot of TV and maybe mm -hmm. that's what did it, you know, like yeah. working parents and and building your own things that you like based on being at home and, you know, mm -hmm. there's a lot to it. I and mean, I feel like I'm just like Shay, I feel like I'm a very generous, open person. I get that from growing up in the South. Because I remember yeah. going to New York when we, I was a, in high school and I remember walking around and I was like making eye contact with people like, hey, how you doing? Oh, I hey, can't do that. Nice to meet you. Oh, wow. I like that sweater. And my dad was like, look at the ground and don't talk to anybody. So I just think that <laughs> friendliness is, Definitely. you grow, you grow up watching that and seeing that and, and, um, and you just, it, becomes a party. It, it's it stands out and I and I think people are just attracted to that southern charm. It's just and it's just naturally in you because usually when I come come home from from when I come back to LA from being home for the holidays, people love to hear me talk because my accent has gotten thicker being around family. <laughs> it was like man, you can you you can say I still Eskimo. Like you know what I'm talking about just I just listen to you talk. Maybe that's why I've done so many commercials in my career. Is because yeah. it's just something genuine about the Southern spirit. It is. You know? I remember for me, I moved to New York to go to school for film scoring uh, at NYU. And as you said, Shannon, we didn't always have access. I remember uh, actually my first time watching the news every morning because my parents had to go to school. So there were school teachers. My mom left before I left to go to school. Yeah. She taught in Columbia County at Bel Air uh, Elementary School. My father taught at Meadowbrook. And I remember watching the news. I remember by the time Mary Morrison came on, it was time for me to <laughs> go. And then when I found out that Mary Morrison's daughter, Jeannie Morrison, played across from me, played flute across from me, and and band, you know, it's like wow, you know. So that was the first person. I think Mary's still on the air, right? And she's still on the air. I yeah, oh, she's still on the air. She's still on the air. Still on the air. Yeah. The crazy thing is, my first time was actually going to WRDW. My church did a mm -hmm. concert for Christmas. Uh, Good Shepherd on WRDW. It was called Music and Things. Uh, with uh, Oscar Demetrio Brown's father. Uh, mm. uh, now he's Reverend Brown. And yeah. uh, shout out to Mary Morrison. Yes! Uh, yeah, Mary. The crazy yeah. thing is, I used to also watch the Parade of Quartets on Sundays. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know, I remember the first time I got to go there, I was like, wow, this is a television studio. You know, so it was like, it's, it wasn't something that we always had a chance to experience, you know, television. I know at Davidson, we all had to do art. We all had to do drama. You know, shout out to Miss Stutz and Miss. Mm -hmm. uh, Angelique Stelman Bondar, I think I said it, I can't remember. Uh, and, you know, we had to do dance. We had to do it with uh, uh, Renee Tool, And we all had to do, you know, academics. We all had to do music. We had to do everything. What do you say? Oh, so with Miss Lamb. Yeah, exactly. And then, you know, Shay, Shannon was talking about, uh, talking about uh, summer programs. I remember we were also in, let me get it right, the SEEP program together, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we've, uh, that was at our job. It's law. Yeah. We were law's class mm -hmm. together. You 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 uh, did a spoken word on Langston Hughes. Langston Hughes. Yeah, yeah. I remember. I remember vividly. Uh, but see, like all of that stuff. Like for me, like I never, even then, when I was into it heavily in theater, I was never looking at it as something I wanted to do as a career. And it was actually um, another Augusta actor, you know, who's you know known his own right, um, Reggie Lewis. Yeah, this was the one that actually was like, man, we could. We could do this Hollywood thing, man. We could, we we can do this. And so yeah. it was actually he was the first person to really plant the seed of us actually taking our talents beyond Augusta. And so I see Reggie all the time by the meat department at Kroger's on Dean. Yep, yep. <laughs> so we so we we made a pack. Yeah, yeah. Back yeah. at the dairy department, he because he did dairy. Yeah, dairy. It was right beside the meat department. You'd have to yep. ask for a special cut back then. <laughs> Yep. Right down the aisle with the RC colas, yeah, yep. and Figo, so, yeah. He, he, he planted he he planted that seed, and we made a pet, you know, back in high school that we was gonna do it no matter what. So, you just you all both mentioned this uh, time in Augusta. So I'm gonna shift to this question: How important is it to build, develop, and nurture relationships in the entertainment industry as one is moving up the ladder? So to speak. you know, a lot of people are all about self. They just want to get on, be on. You know, uh, we talked about that the last time I was in LA, right before 
like literally a week before the whole COVID-19 pandemic really hit hard here in America. We were all talking. You know, a lot of people do whatever they can to get on, to be a part of the group. And then once they feel like they've got it or they're, you know, they got casted or they got the job, they're they're done. They don't speak to you. They're not there anymore. People will look uh, up to you as a mentor and they want to be the mentee. They get the job and then they're gone. But what they don't realize, a lot of things in life are a circle and they come back around or they didn't know who you are connected to. And sometimes I've seen it in the music industry, in the entertainment industry, period. People will come back around and ask, oh, could you do this? Could you do that? Uh, so can you all talk about, because you all have seen it as you moving from the East Coast to the West Coast and having a, having to connect with people that you didn't know, but having to use your Augusta sixth sense, you know, or <laughs> the spirit of discernment, however you want to say it. Uh, my aunt would always tell me, don't take no wooden nickels, you know. Yeah, yeah. You know, but now not only have you all been people who have had to develop and uh, create relationships with other people in the entertainment industry, you know, on the West Coast, totally different way of living than the East Coast, definitely in the South, definitely than Georgia, definitely different than Augusta. But now I know that you all have people that come to you and, you know, they move there. There are people from Augusta that are there. There are people from, from college that are there, from Howard, from Clark, Atlanta, and they want connections, you know. Uh, some of them are genuine. Some of them just want you to put them on. So can you all talk about that? And I'm actually going to take off this banner so we can really, really see see what you're saying now. <laughs> yeah, so whoever wants to go first. Man, that's – is oh, my God. I mean, it's, it's it's a total different way of life. I mean, once, we, once coming out here to the West Coast – I mean, you know, usually when we were growing up in Augusta, whoever the artsy kids were, you know, we were like our own tribe. But then you move to a city where everybody's that tribe, mm -hmm. you mm. know? And, um, you know, there's a saying we have out here, a thousand people move here every day and a thousand people leave. Mm. And one thing about Hollywood is that you never know when someone's big break is going to happen. So what tends to happen is a lot of friendships are very superficial in the beginning because no one really expresses their real true feelings towards you because they don't know where you're going to end up. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Hell no. Wow. I, I, I might not like Shannon, but I'm not going to tell her because <laughs> she might get that deal at Fox next year and, you know, wow. her own show, and I might have to audition in front of her. And you know what I'm saying? That's, <laughs> that's, that's just what it is. Me being from the South and not growing up that way and being raised to where, you know, I'm just usually like genuine people. I think since I've lived out here, I've gotten very reclusive. You know, I wasn't known as a reclusive person when I lived in um, Augusta or Atlanta. I went out, was always out, had friends, was social. Here, I just have a very small network of people that I connect with. And that's on a close friendship level. Now, as far as a professional and networking level, I got tons of friends, man, that or associates or contemporaries that, you know, we all look out for each other. We all take care of each other. It's, I mean, that's, I feel that's the only way I've been able to maintain out here because, because of my nature, you know, I'm not as famous as some other people, but I got some very famous friends and they're always like, yo, come to this with me, or I want to introduce you to this person. And, you know, because they respect my gift and my talent and my ideas. I mean, I got friends, man, especially since this whole COVID thing take place that, you know, they'll come to me and I'll put them on tape for like for, for film roles or whatever. And they'll let me pick what to send their manager, or their agent. They don't even look at it. They trust me. And because we have that mutual respect, we always look out for one another because the whole game is a roller coaster. It's up and down for everybody. And you never know when it's going to be that way for you. So usually when I'm up, I'm looking out for my friends and people that I know. You know, when I had my TV show, I'm getting people SAG vouchers. I'm getting up and coming directors I knew, you know, who could shadow, you know what I'm saying? On um, one of my one of my closest friends, brother that went to Morehouse, I did like his first feature film. I went in for, you know, a small role. He ended up giving me a lead. So the lead in the, my first lead in the feature film, a brother from Morehouse gave me that opportunity. And then when he got a network TV show, guess who he picked up the phone and called? So, you know, that's how it works. It's been plenty of times I've reached out to Shannon and I'm like, yo, I know XYZ is looking for an editor. You free. You got a gig, you know? And she's like, I'm working right now. I was like, all right, cool. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know what I'm saying? Exactly how it works. And then, but you always know who your real friends are because you'll know when people get opportunities like that and they don't think of you. Or, you know, for some reason they don't know your number, but then when they're on the down slope of their roller coaster, then all of a sudden you're on speed dial again. Mm -hmm. I don't do it. Yep. Wow, that's that's real, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shannon, no, you know, I mean, it's, just, it's, it's how I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, behind the scenes and nobody knows us, but it's the same. It's the same. It's like, um, I am anybody that reaches out to me. I usually, you know, unless I'm super busy and I just, it just gets lost in the mix. I respond. And what I usually do for people that are like, I want to be an editor or, I want to be an assistant editor and I'm trying to work my way into the business. I give them assignments to do before they mm. even come back to me again. And 75% mm. of people don't do it. Oh, oh, we used to do that. I used to be like, oh. like yeah, man, I want to get into acting. I was like, um, you know, in the, let me give me a, what's your, what's your best August Wilson monologue? And they'd be like, well, who is yeah. August Wilson? Oh, I was like, okay, mm. go read some plays. I'm just, you know, because a lot of times when people I found on the majority of people usually aren't trying to figure out how to get into business, they are just dry begging for you to give them something. Exactly. And they don't really understand that it doesn't really work that way, you know, mm. at all. You know? Well, it's, 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 you know, it looks very glamorous what we yeah. do. It look, it's, but it's a lot of hard work, you know? And I also, I do the same thing. I'm like, before you step into a room, before I will have you into a room, you need to know this, this, and this. Like, what are you watching? Can you speak intelligently about performance or yeah. character or story or plot? Do you understand these things? Like, and a lot of people that I talk to don't watch, don't watch stuff. And yeah, that just blows my mind. It's like, if I hear about something that people are watching, I'll at least go watch one or two episodes of it. Well, I always ask people, like, what are you doing where you're at? Like, um, you know, <laughs> yeah. I'm always finding it weird because it's funny, like, because actually now, hell, Atlanta's the number two, number one film place in the world. So I'm like, it should be other round. I should be calling my folks in Atlanta, <laughs> like, hey, <laughs> can you open up? Because, yeah. I mean, it's so it, it's technically no excuse. And, and, you know, we've been in our careers for such a long time now. That the things that we did to get where we are or to maintain don't exist now. So honestly, I don't really know how to tell somebody trying to get in the game now what to do. Yeah. Because then you know it's the whole social media aspect. It's it's, it's so tenacity, much. it's the same, yeah. same ideals, tenacity, being persistent, being, being prepared, human, being prepared, you know, prepared. like all of that, yeah. like watching what you like and reaching out to people about stuff that you like. Don't go, if you hate watching Westworld, don't try to reach out to the people that work on Westworld. I mean, right. you're not going to be genuine anyway. You know, I don't know if for acting, you know, like you play a role, but you know, for- I mean, you gotta watch everything. I mean, you never know who it is, right? Like, you know, right. sometimes yeah. if I got a audition or if I got a, if I got a, a producer session, I like to go look at some of the other things that they produce. Uh, yeah. Go look at right. whatever the last you know project was, just so I can get a feel of how they work or their tempo or their style, their creativity, and um, just to give me a leg up. Like, like I like sometimes when I have like sitcom auditions, I'll actually just put, I, you know, I have my own system where I just play that show on repeat all day long, just wow. to get immersed in the rhythm of how they yeah. do their show. You know, Listen, everybody. There's a there's a there's a tip. There's a hit. hot tip. That is that is tip. Like you know, sometimes you know, you know, it's weird. You know, you got people come out here. It's so many things because then it's like acting classes, and it's like California is a different place. You know, and I don't know how it is in New York, but it's a different place pursuing your your career out here. Is because there's so many actors, there's so many uh, producers, there's so many. This is where everyone comes. And because everyone is out here trying to make it, it's so many ways for people to take advantage of you. Mm. And so, you know, people run into a lot of those traps. So that's why I'm always- and there's so many ways for people to take advantage of you. Exactly. Ways for you. Like my mentor, I'll put it to you how my mentor put it to me. Um, there's more ways to make money off of entertainers than offer entertainers to make money. Everybody wants an agent and a manager and they don't always need to get that as soon as they- They don't they always need to get that. Or, or yeah. 
like I always tell people, if I had to give you a tip, I would say, man, start getting as many student films as possible. You know, get as much tape on yourself doing what you want to do. Like real talk, every, people knew me around Atlanta. Like when somebody needed an actor or needed somebody to MC, needed somebody for come read a poem, some come by to come do this. I literally was making about four five hundred dollars a week just showing up, just you know, MCing a program. I, I wanted my hustle then was to be synonymous with what I wanted to do. So I would leave my home at like 6 a.m. in the morning and come in at 2 a.m. and do that like all day, every way. I was, it didn't matter to me if a, if a role in the a, in a, uh, creative loafing at the time, if it didn't say specifically white male actor, I auditioned for it. I didn't care what it was. Yeah. I went to the Georgia Shakespeare Festival and auditioned for Macbeth. They asked me what role I wanted to read for. I said, well, I read the audition. I want to read for Macbeth. Y'all didn't say it had to be a white person. And they <laughs> let me read. Yeah. And I got a call back and I didn't get it, but I wanted, but that was my way of showing every director, every theater director, every artistic director in town, who I was and what I was capable of. So I was just using that audition as an introduction. So that was my hustle. And then, so when I got out to California, I went out to agents the same way. I was like, well, they told me you got to mail your stuff in, but I was like, well, they got to tell me no to my face. So I was just dropping, just showing up cold, knocking on people's door. And I met a guy that believed in me enough and, um, he called a casting director for the NBC show Kingpin. He literally called them every day. It was like, you have to see this guy. They told him no every day. And he still kept calling. And Bob Maronis was like, all right, Bob, send him in. We'll take a look at him. And the rest was history. You know what I love about uh, both of you is that both of you are very diverse. And uh, one of my mentors told me years ago uh, my mentor actually happens to be one of them. Well, a lot of them are actually happen to be this person. This person happens to be a millionaire. And they said, Damien, this is a long time ago. The way that you uh, become successful is that you have to have multiple streams of income. Mm -hmm. There's a point where you focus, you know, in school, we had we had mentors in our community, our family, our parents, uh, our grandparents, our peers, our teachers, uh, leaders of the community groups you know, they're in Augusta, at our church especially. And, you know, they mentored us. And so a lot of times people are always in a forward direction. I tell right. a lot of my mentees now something that Winton shared with me. Mm -hmm. And he said, Damien, you know, we spend so much time here in America focusing on education and pleasing our parents, then going to college, then graduating from college, then getting a job or going to graduate school or specialization school. Then after we get that job, we want to do something bigger, bigger, bigger. And we focus on pleasing the generations that are ahead of us. He said, but I want you to start focusing on something that I didn't really focus on until maybe a little later on in my career. He said, you're always focusing on people that are ahead of you. But the issue with that is after a while, you'll look and all those people will be gone mm -hmm. or they will have retired. He said, and then a lot of times your peers may or may not hire you or give you opportunities because they want the same opportunities. Mm. But he said it's important that you immediately reach back to those that are younger than you. Mm. And don't wait until you're too old to do that. You know, you're never too old to do something people say, but there is a time I think where it's a little late to try to wait in your career and say, oh, I'm gonna give back. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, I think it's important because sometimes the jobs that we have may come from a student, as yeah. you said. Make them a teenager because now with uh, you know uh, social media influencers and the new technological innovation, the paradigm has shifted. So mm -hmm. we can't just look towards you know oh I'm gonna go get somebody who lives in Beverly Hills or right, somebody, right. You know, here in, in, in uh, New York City with the big label you know because now the the next thing popping may be an independent label. Everything is shifting. Right. The music industry, the film Everything. industry, Atlanta. Yeah. People are making uh, um, films in their homes now due to uh, COVID-19 and this global pandemic. Uh, you know, so what I appreciate about the two of you is ever since I've known uh, known each of you, you all have always had your hand in many things. And I said this in an earlier episode, not that you are a jack of all trades and master of none, but you all did several things well, and you still do that. And not just are you performing uh, and executing in your industry at a high level, but you all also uh, execute as human beings and as citi citizen artists, I'll say that, <laughs> at a very high level. And I appreciate that because you're approachable. Uh, I know you all, but even when I've been with you all in the public in LA or even in Augusta, if we see each other or something, you know, you all actually 
take time to talk to people. And that's a good, that's a good quality. And I think that keeps you uh, connected to people and to what really is important. So this is my next question, uh, because I just want to shout you all out. I'm super proud of both of you. I can't say that enough because I know some people are just tuning in. And I think it's very important for people of color and for peers to celebrate their own and for family to celebrate their own. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud to come from Augusta, Georgia, you know, Lawrence Fishburne, Jesse Norman, you know, so many wonderful people, James Brown, but also the two of you. And so I just want to shout you all out right now. And uh, this is the next question. The next question is, tell us more about your exact work slash role in the entertainment industry. But instead of that, I'd like for you to tell me more about what I'm about to place on the screen. And then tell me who are some of the people that you've worked with that are really well known that are known. I know you mentioned Nick Cannon. Cannon, you haven't mentioned one particular person. There's a, there's a person that everybody loved the show. Uh, because I think it just went off. There was a finale. You know what I'm talking about with the eye. But I want to let everybody watching know that Shannon has uh, her own business. She's an entrepreneur <laughs> called Dream Color Creative Incorporated. So you can tell us about that. You've talked about your career otherwise. And uh, in addition to being an editor and a writer and all the many things she's, she's doing and everybody, there is a project coming soon. I'm speaking into the atmosphere that Shay and Shannon and I are going to work on together. <laughs> yeah, and then Shay... You have mm -hmm. Sunset Grove Entertainment. I remember, mm -hmm. Shay, uh, before you were married, I think Reggie was there. We were all staying there at your place. And uh, I remember you showed me your logo. And mm -hmm. you were showing me. And that was my first time actually getting the idea to have a logo. You know, you did things so far ahead of time. Uh, because, look, that's our name. We, we love you. Our name. I want both of you all to talk in either order about your own businesses, but you all have to let people know as creatives, it is very difficult dealing with the ebb and flow, the up and down. And if we de don't channel our creative energies into our own streams, so to speak, uh, a mm -hmm. lot of times, like now with this global pandemic, when the industry looks like it's shut down, but they're actually just creating new paradigms and new things are happening. And when you don't get a call, you know, when you're not the next person up on stage or the next person that got the commercial or the film or something mm -hmm. to edit. I, I believe you all are using your energies and putting it into your own uh, uh, companies, your own businesses. Uh, some of the ideas that you have that will not come in the earth unless you do it. And then you mm -hmm. also leave a legacy for your children and those coming behind you. Can you all talk a little bit about uh, Sunset Grove Entertainment, Shay, and uh, Dream Color Creative Incorporated, Shannon, and name some of the people because that's what people want to hear. You know, some of the names you work with, you know, like I S S, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so I, I did a movie called too. The Photograph with Issa Rae and Lakeith Stanfield. Yeah. And they are both a pleasure, a pleasure mm -hmm. to work with. Thank and you. um, huh? Queen Sugar with Queen Ava. Sugar mm -hmm. with Ava DuVernay. Yeah. Um, I just did Black AF, that's Kenya Barris's new show for Netflix. Um I have worked with Yara Shahidi. I cut, uh, Yara Shahidi uh, directed a short film that I cut that went to mm -hmm. um, Toronto Film Festival. And she is super smart, like just a brilliant, brilliant young woman who is, she's gonna be world leader. I, I see it now. Um, is that your teacher? Is that one of the teachers? Didn't you go there, Shannon, before they- Oh my God, A. Ride Mary. Yes, I went to A. Ride Mary. Um, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, so what, what was the question? Oh, um, oh business. So I, um, I, don't I don't necessarily have a lot of businesses. Like I'm not into real estate and I'm not into, you know, I don't have that, but I do. Um, cover a lot of genres and what I do like action, drama, comedy, and that's rare because most people get pigeonholed into one specific genre. genre. Um, but I was just like, I'll cut whatever, whatever. Like when I was just trying to get into scripted, anybody that came to me with a short film, I would cut it, you know, for free, for mm -hmm. dinner, for whatever it was. If it was scripted, I would cut it. 
And um, that was a lot of, that was great experience working with different directors. And it just got me more and more experience cutting. Um, but I will say, I also write, I also produced and wrote a web series. Um, I think as an editor, you, you see so many things on the back, on the back end and it makes you want to, you have to reverse engineer it. So it makes you want to like really engineer it, you know, when, once you want to come up with the characters yourself and, and you just see so many, you have so much of that experience. I also want to direct, um, and uh, I've been told a lot of the, a lot of great directors were editors to begin with and why, um, but yeah, it, it, that, you know, multiple streams of income. I wouldn't say I have multiple streams of income from all different industries, but I am very broad in, in what I know how to edit, what I know how to write, what I like, I like all different kinds of things. So it's just natural that I would, I, you know, accept jobs and go after jobs that are all different kinds of things too. So. Awesome. Dream color. Dream, Dream color. color. Well, that, I, like I mean, that. that's just not my business that I, that I, um, that company when I, I loan myself as an, as an editor to companies. And so that's, that's a whole business uh, venture that is, is specific to, I don't know if it's specific to television and film, but a lot of people do that too, in order to keep some sort of independence when you're on a job and also, you know, there may be some grant people online now watching that want to uh, give money. To grant. Grant. <laughs> yeah. Well, I do. I, oh, I also am very active at the editors guild. I am on the board of the Ujima entertainment coalition, mm. which is black post professionals. Mm. We are a 501 C. So if anybody is interested in grant money, the Ujima entertainment coalition is a good place to send that money. Um, but yeah, I'm an active at the guild and, and that is also too, like that, when you like a lot of different things, you do a lot of different things. I, I since Damien knew me in middle school, I just mm -hmm. done the most, <laughs> you know, like I was junior class president and I did this and did that. And that, that hasn't stopped. That's just part of my personality. So, and, and it, it does all kind of ebb and flow like sometimes there'll be so much going on that you're like i have to start saying no to something right. like yeah. I can, it can't be yes all the time um and there are just times when there's nothing going on and you're like hmm, what else can i get into hmm, like what other kind of thing can i start up and that's just that's me that's who i am as a person so definitely that's, yeah, yeah. so Shay, right. your turn but right before now you're was, wasn't your logo like a tree yeah, that's my logo I created when I was in. Um, that's why you're in front of a tree now. Yeah, yeah, that was well, kind of the same kind of. Yeah, you know, I want to play. say that, but also, man, you changed my life, brother. I remember being out there in L.A. and you were very transparent, sharing with me the times when the ebb and flow happened in your career, mm -hmm. and you know, I'd never really thought about that. And so, after you shared that and about how you had to find something else to do with your energies creatively, mm -hmm. and you know, it, it helped me because then I said, okay, now I know what I need to do when, you know, there's a, there's no work, you know, so that yeah, really, right. that's my life, but yeah, I'll let right. you go talking about Man, uh, your company and everything. Um, Sunset Grove, um, the name came from, um, the um, chairman Oz Nesbitt of uh, Rockdale County, um, Conyers who just won, you know, his reelection. Yeah. Um, who's from Augusta, Georgia, TW Josie graduate. We actually lived together in Conyers for a while. His family's like my cousin, but, um, he came up with the name because, um, he just felt, our personalities, because we're a lot alike, was developed and encompassed the area we grew up in, which was Sunset Homes and um, Beulah Grove Baptist Church. So mm. he came up the name. He came up with the name. Wow. Um, he came up with the name when um, we were living uh. together. <laughs> and um, as time went on, and uh, when I just started decided I wanted to start my own thing, I reached out to him. I asked him, "Was he going to do anything with the name?" And I was like, you know, ask could I have permission to use it? I say for one, just out of respect for where we grew up and just, you know, mm -hmm. out of respect for, you know, the role model you've been to me in my life. And man, he was just like, take it, it's yours. And wow. so I did that. And um, so I've been just 
I'm um, trying to diversify. First of all, not something people, I'm going to say this because people are not going to believe it, but I'm tremendously shy, believe it or not, in, in, a, in, a, in a weird way. And so a lot of a lot of times when I'm not playing a character, uh, when it comes to writing, when it comes to producing, when it comes to doing other things, there's a different level. It's a different kind of vulnerability that you have that you expose yourself to than you do when you're an actor. So which is a part of me that I always kept private. And so it's that part of myself that especially even during this quarantine time that I've been working on and, and putting a lot of more of my thoughts and and how I feel out there and not just hiding behind characters or just allowing tidbits to come in to come in to make a character seem real. But um, so that's what I've been doing. I produced um, associate producer of a game show that we're trying to get a deal for. Byron Allen hit us up. It's called Urban Dictionary. Wow. Yeah. Um, I'm, um, I'm proud of an organization that I'm one of the board members of. It's called Roots of Knowledge Empowerment Institute, um, Roki. Um, it's a summer camp right now we do for um, African-American kids specifically, but it's open to all races. And it's basically about educating them about the African diaspora and our accomplishments and how much we've done for the globe, not just in this country and reconnecting our youth um, back with, you know, their homeland. And the idea actually came from our founder, founder John Carroll. And um, when he noticed that, you know, a lot of the Jewish kids out here, they'll go to school after school and they learn their culture and their history. And so instead of complaining about the system, we had this idea. It was like, well, there's nothing stopping us from teaching our own kids. You know, you don't have to wait for the school system to do it. So he started this um, foundation, man, and this organization. And I've been loving being a part of it. And, um, you know, we do it, man. And I, and it's funny, I was explaining, I told Shannon, I said, Shannon, you work with all my friends, it was, you know, everybody except me. You know, I know. My, my best friend Omar Dorsey from Queen Sugar is my brother. Yeah, yeah. Tone Bell, you work with Tone. Oh, Lakeith, yeah. you work with Lakeith. I said, okay, yeah. all right, you don't work with the whole well, family. Commercials. I don't cut. I, cut I know. Commercials. I know. I know. I and I always tell everybody. <laughs> My friend Shay from Augusta, every time there's a mm -hmm. Super Bowl, he has a commercial. So, <laughs> you know him. Mm -hmm. You've seen him. So, um, you know, we yeah. got that going on. Um, um, so, I mean, that's kind of what I'm doing, just trying to find creative stuff to, to do. Um, tapping and doing um, more voiceovers now. Um, for me, it's kind of weird because I kind of feel like I'm starting over because I kind of took a, a backseat a little bit when I had my kids. Um, so my son is uh, four now. So... I've been a full-time dad for the last four years, like literally full-time. Like my yeah. son was in auditions with me and mm -hmm. you know, everybody knows him around town cause he went everywhere with me and that got a little, that was kind of easy, it was cool. But then it got more difficult when the second one came along and you know, you know, you can think, you think you can feel like you can do both. And, um, but then there's a different level of tiredness that you get that, you know, can mm -hmm. come through. So, you know, I kind of, Peel back a little bit, and um, so now that they're older, I'm really going at everything more aggressively. You know, I've been blessed, man. Look, I tell everybody, I was like, you know, I believe in you know pursuing your dreams. I believe in unions. I was like, hell, because of our strong union, I've earned my retirement. You know, what I'm saying, I'm. It's just a lot of things that people just don't think about that you really just have to approach the business as a business. Um, you know, um, the sky's the limit now, especially now that everything, you know, production has gotten so much easier. I mean, people shooting stuff on their phones now. Yeah. You know, there's commercials being shot on phones, movies being shot on phones. So now it's funny because I used to always complain because I felt like the industry, a lot of things had moved towards either nepotism or who, you know, if you didn't have the money, you couldn't really get through. And I feel now that because creative tools have become so much cheaper and accessible, that is going to flip entertainment and just creative arts back to true creatives is because now you don't have an excuse. You don't need to get that, you know, $30,000 camera, you know what I'm saying? To shoot your student film or to shoot your little short. So it's just about telling good stories, man. And, you know, I was fortunate enough on um, this past year, I did um, the way back with being athletic um, that came back and did pretty well. Uh, most of our stuff got you know cut out of the movie but that's how the game rolls <laughs> you know what i'm saying but um it was a pleasure working with him man and it was um 
just listening to some of his stories and some of the advice he gave me. Um, so it's about it, man. I could talk all day, man. It's just so many stories. Like I just celebrated my 18th year yesterday. Yesterday was my 18th year in California and my sixth wow. Um, oh, wow. um, yeah. wedding anniversary. So I've been out here 18 years. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow, that's amazing. Um, yeah, I remember you all got married in Vegas. Vegas, yeah. And I think Shannon was in Vegas. The Shannon, same. no, she was there for the wedding. Shannon was there. Yeah, the wedding, yeah, yeah. yeah. Was at the wedding. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's interesting. You all have already named several brilliant and dynamic people of color in mm -hmm. your industry: writers, editors, filmmakers, actors, actresses, directors, etc. How do you use your platform as catalysts or change agents uh, representing protest and reconciliation? Uh, because you all are so uh, creative and you're savants, you all really know music as well. I know Shannon with uh, uh, that movie, the photograph, the mm -hmm. film, you were talking about how wonderful it was dealing with the music. Shay, yeah. you are a, a music guru as well. We all listen to all types of music from classical to uh, Hip hop to rap to country, like everything, everything possible. <laughs> everything possible. So mm -hmm. my question is, uh, you know, there's so many great, I, I mean, so many great musicians have spent their life uh, being agents of protest and reconciliation. My last episode was about the Harlem Renaissance, the writers, uh, you know, Langston Hughes, even people ca that came after that, Zora Neale Hurston, uh, Nikki Giovanni. Uh, Elaine Locke, and then the musicians, Duke Ellington, Nina Simone. I'm just saying like, I'm just naming different people. We were talking about Nas and so many other uh, great musicians. But how do you find yourself, uh, even though you're having some time to work uh, for other people uh, as far as their vision, their mm -hmm. creative processes or process, processes, however you want to say it, for all those people who said that one correct English the way I said it, so I said it all three different ways. So I'm going to <laughs> Hollywood celebrities here. How do you find yourself being a change agent, a catalyst as a person of color and still having a, a platform or a voice? I'll say that, a voice of protest you know, affiliation. It's, I mean, I would say for myself, because I actually, before I, you know, when my transition from music, um, simultaneously I was in uh, public speaking. So I'm an award-winning orator nationally, by the way, well, for those out there that don't know. Um, it's difficult nowadays in a social media area era is because sometimes like you have people that follow you, people that look to you. So you have a, a, a broader audience. So a lot of messages and things and, and you know, things you want people to pay attention to, you can, you can reach directly now because of social media. But also now it's easier for people to take things out of context, to take sound bites, to take clips, to, you know, so like if you're not really at a certain level financially, it gets very difficult. You know, it's like, you know, you don't want to say the wrong thing, then you lose your job because you got two toddlers at home. Mm -hmm. You know, people always like, well, you want this person to do this, one person to do that. And I say that's very difficult because we don't support artists the same way. You know, when we look at the Harry Belafonte's, we look at a lot of the early musicians and, you know, they used to have this thing called a chitlin circuit that I used to actually take offense when people would talk about it in a negative way, because the chitlin circuit is what funded a lot of programs in the community because artists could go there and perform and make money and didn't have to worry about backlash from the mainstream industry. And so we don't really have a network like that that we used to because we know it's the same game that we play. You say something somebody doesn't like and they want to, you know, um, go after your advertisers yeah. or, you know, they want to call your boss or, you know, so you just have to get to the point to where you have to ask yourself, is this particular thing worth it for me? What Pick your battles. Like I give you an example. So my first my first job in California TV show. So the guy was a gangster. He's a thug. He worked for um, criminals. He lived with his grandma, you know, yada, yada. He was... You know, he was, you know, it was a hood dude. And I was just, I was 24 at the time. And I was just, I just didn't want to play it that way. Mm. And so I went to my audition dressed in khaki, some penny loafers and a pink polo shirt mm. for a gangster role. Twice. Twice. Mm. And when I got the role, the day they asked me to sit down and he talked to me, the first thing Dan Sackheim said was, you don't look like what we was looking for. You came in totally opposite 
but you were so fucking believable. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to curse. You were so believable. That's what he said. You know what I'm saying? It's too hard. <laughs> so he, so that's that's what he said. And so, but I told him, and they started writing a character based on my interpretation. And I was like, I just didn't want to do it the way they always do it because that's how people see it. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'll, you know, I always learn um, uh, Mr. Barnwell, who taught me in Up With Bound, I think he taught at Westside. You know, he, he used to have a saying where he says, all humans are capable of all behavior. Mm -hmm. So and as, a, as an actor, my job is to show people who they are, where they are, and what condition they're in, whether they like it or not. Mm -hmm. And so I can't be afraid to take roles because if that role of that character exists in society, then that story should be told. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Now I become judge and jury of whose story is valid and whose story is not. And that's not how we can we want to be because, you know, one day if I make it to the pearly gates, you know, I want my story to be valid. You know what I'm saying? I want to be remembered. So whatever it is, I try to bring dignity to the role, but I, I, I try to stay away from stuff that has no redemptive quality, that has no, no, no three dimensional aspect. That's not, you know, you know, so that's me. That's my personal fight. But I can't tell another actor what they got to do to pay their bills. I mean, I had audition for a, 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 a commercial one time. This is so, this is a real story. I'm not going to say what brand. And they came in and I really wanted this commercial because it was a father helping his daughters home with their homework. And the wife came home, he helped her get the food at the door. He comes in the dining room, the girls think Papa brought dinner, then he takes all the credit and the wife is like, Psh. you know? <laughs> but it was a fun, it was a cool commercial because I really wanted to do it because I really wanted the image of a father, you know, taking care of his kids. I mean, that's, that's true to my life. So I did it, they loved me. We came back for the audition, for the callback. They had two lines and it was like, okay, you got to go over there with choreography. And I'm like, choreography? They were like, yeah, you know, it's a dance you're gonna do. And I was like, okay, when y'all started dancing? And we, that's not what we did the first time. Mm. And so I went, listened, saw it. So when I get in the room with the director and he was like, all right, cool, we did the thing. And he was like, all right, what happened, Shay? And I was like, what do you mean what happened? He was like, you know, when you get the bag from your wife, you know, you're supposed to do a little dance when you came in. I was like, I don't, for what? Why I got to dance for chicken? They were just happy because they was hungry. Mm. Got to do a dance with it too. I said, that's not my thing. I said, if y'all don't mm. want me, then that's fine. So I didn't get it, but somebody else did. The commercial ran once and it got a lot of backlash, mm. but I don't knock the dude for doing it because I don't know why he needed that check. But it's those little battles for me personally that sometimes I, I, I fight those kind of battles, but you mm. know, and then, but like at some point, I don't even care. Like there's times where I've had, when I didn't have representation, and I had a manager that was interested in me that had a connection with a certain producer and director whose work I don't really like, who I don't really care for as a person because I knew them back in the day. And they was like, but you can get rid of all of that. And I was like, look, I work at McDonald's before I work with them. Mm. You know, my art, my creativity is what I love is what I do, but it's not who I am. It doesn't make or break me. I can work in the mall and still act. So it don't matter. So I'm not one of those so people. So your own personal integrity is what comes with you. But I always caution people because I, I always caution people about being so judgmental when other entertainers or people don't do what people what we think they should do because right. that stuff has to already be in you. Yeah. If you're not somebody who was community oriented and cared about giving back or cared about the youth before you got famous and rich, you ain't gonna they ain't gonna care about it now. So people just think just because somebody gets money is this magic bullet that hits them that they like oh I got to do all these things. No, that stuff has already got to be in you. Audience. You know and so that's that's my personal thing how I do it, deal with it. Wow, Shannon, as an editor. I mean, I don't have a platform, so. <laughs> um, but I mean, I think there's a there's a lot going on right now with like, you know, police brutality and racial equality, and the and the editing industry is very very white male heavy. So mm. I am like one of. I can count on one hand black women that cut studio movies, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, I am very active in trying to, I'm on the diversity committee at the Guild. Like I um, make sure there are programs that lift up. I'm on the African-American steering committee to mm -hmm. be specific to lift up black people that are, that have no access, that have no connections. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I always try to hire. You guys took the photograph back to Payne College, right? What? 
Did oh, you guys? Yes, we won. Like that's the pandemic hit, and then we. Oh did, man, because I because we had to cancel it. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but but I remember when you told me you were doing that. I thought that was just such a wonderful thing. I was and, so um, excited. Yeah. So tell them about yeah yeah you can go yeah, ahead I'm but sorry. The pand- I mean it, hopefully it'll still happen in the fall maybe we'll see yeah. when all this if people would wear their masks right and we could get, then I could go to Payne College and take the photograph yeah. but um but yeah and I you know because I got I'm a, a member of the American Cinema Editors which is the ACE that's behind mm-hmm. people's names when you see movies and I got got into that program through a diversity mentorship. So Mm -hmm. there are programs, people are doing things. You just have to know about them and you just have to Mm -hmm. like, I have, I send out everything alerts. There's this program that's gone. Damien did that great music camp last, last Mm -hmm. summer and, you know, free music camp. And, you know, you just, people have to have their own, you know, drive and motivation to do things. But there's also like guiding others in right. the way. You know, I when I was at AFI, um, I'll never forget because Love Jones, I'm not Love Jones, Love and Basketball had been out like a previous two years previous, and Gina Prince Bikewood and Tara Lynn Shopshire came to a seminar. And you know, I was in a room full of people that didn't even know what Love and Basketball was. And I was just like, Ah, uh, like oh my god, these are two black women that are making films, and you know I spoke to Terry afterwards, and she ended up becoming my mentor. Like she, to this day, I will call her, ask her advice on things. You know, she invites me to screenings for her movies that she's doing, and and it's a two way street because you when you mentor somebody or when you're a mentee, you get something out of it. Both people get something out of it. Mm, so okay. I would, you know, I always encourage people to take on mentors or, you know, if you love somebody's work, I mean, I like, like Shay, like what, what I did, I don't know if people can do that anymore, but on Facebook, I it used to be that you could just email anybody. Like you just looked up yeah. their name and you could send them a message and they would get it. Now it goes into some separate inbox or something that people don't ever look at so you never know that somebody random is there are categories it. for that right yeah because right, right, right. so I'll, I'll get and i you know and i tell people and if anybody's watching this um is that my computer freezing yes my good yeah well, we can hear you though your, your voice wasn't yeah. freezing. all right yeah no. so like i like i'll get tons of people Oh no, what happened? You're doing the robot. I don't know what happened. My computer must have got hot or something. I know. <laughs> well, but your voice is not frozen. We can hear you. So now we can't hear him. Okay. Okay. So okay. one of the things that um, you know, people always email me and I'm always getting talking about their kids and want to get into business. Uh-oh. <laughs> That's so weird. Hello. Yeah, no, we can hear you. We can hear you. Okay. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll, I mean, now I guess you can, you can DM people on Twitter and, you know, they may or may not respond. So there's yeah. still like a way to like get to people. Okay, can you hear that? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. <laughs> it's still breaking up. Poor if you thing. want to log out and log back in, you can. Okay. You want to do that? Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so we we're we're constantly finding uh, people that are reaching out to us, like you said, Twitter DMs. Yeah. Instagram, you know, I have to check all the the different categories of messages that you haven't checked. You know, now Instagram has like sure, yeah. two different categories, you know, yeah, like a, and with Facebook. Like a, some people's message, it goes right to spam and I don't always check those. And sometimes there are business opportunities that are in those because uh, there was a certain etiquette where you had to use email to contact someone or contact your manager or their agent. But now people will just reach right out to you on. And then on 
Twitter and Instagram. It's right. true. I mean, and in some ways that opens it up. In some ways, people get a thousand things a day and they kind of shut down on that. But I mean, I remember my first job that I got in New York, I was watching Celebrity Poker Showdown because that was my mm -hmm. first job. And I was watching at home before I, I worked on it. And yeah. I saw who the producers were and I went to their website and their emails were right on that website. And I just emailed them, you know, and I said, I love the show and I love the editing. And, you know, I just wanted you to know. And if you ever are looking for anybody, I'm an assistant editor. And and when I went to the interview, the woman who interviewed me, who was not like one of the producers, she was their post supervisor. So that's her name wasn't like in the credits, like it, it wasn't one of the two people that owned the company that I had the audacity to email, but she was a post super. She said, we loved your letter. Look, we put it on the wall and, and they had put it on the wall in the office. And, I'm back now. And um, they had put it on the wall in the office and it was just, you know, being genuine and reaching out to people. And that's what did it. Welcome back. Thank you, thank you, thank you. About people emailing you, uh, Shay. Well, I'm just saying I get. I don't. I don't check that email regularly on Facebook. I know people get hit me up all the time, and I miss things. So if you don't have my number, like, or my email address, like, I literally don't check that every day. You know what I'm saying? That's what. That's what we were just saying. Yeah. 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 So, but I do get messages. People asking me about their kids, about different programs, how to get started. And um, one of the things I will say, be careful with a lot of programs out there that's wanting you to pay a lot of money up front. Right. There's been a lot of that going along where, you know, your kid can be the next Disney star. And you got to go do this, you know, this audition and this thing. And it's like 800 bucks for the first round. And then, like, you can go to L.A. That's another two thousand dollars. Try to stay away from those things. Oh, it's, it's huge money. It's yeah. huge. It's big too. business. It's big business. And and I know I probably get they're gonna kill me for this, but I don't care. So, Georgia's yeah. a right to work state, so there's a lot of things that um, the union, um, our unions that protect us from here in California, don't have the same jurisdiction in Georgia, even if it's a union signatory film. So the actors there in the entertainment community back in Georgia, man, y'all really need to get together, man, because. Um, I have noticed some things and even SAG has noticed some things of ways that people are being taken advantage of and uh, that's mm. not cool. But when you got people that just want to be owned and they'll take whatever's given to them, it's kind of hard to make that argument. So, but I just want people to value who they are as human beings more than anything, more than anything. Your, your, your humanity is paramount, you know? And so, so uh, make sure y'all, make sure y'all do your due diligence and homework, you know, when you pursue them because they, we all and, and even in all our, our spec, respective experiences we all know there are so many ways that people get taken advantage of because they're so uber focused on whatever the end goal is and they don't watch the the traps on that way you know what i'm saying so exactly that's just i just wanted to put that out there because i i've seen it you know i mean you know some of the i got stories i tell you i got stories man i when i first moved out here i was so blessed to have a tv show after being out here just a few weeks and mm -hmm. you know i allow anybody who went to co who went to my college they knew to contact one of the advisors and that advisor knew to give them a number and if she vouched for them they could stay with me when they came so a lot of people have matriculated through the walls of my my home yeah. and yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying like that needed right. a place. I when I visit out there, I've seen some of those people. Yeah, yeah, some of them are, are famous, famous now, and yeah. we're still tight. And um, but then I will say I had one friend, man, who lost his life, you know, because he, you know, he wasn't prepared like he should, and so that that's something that haunts me. That's why I'm real you know, staunch about telling people, man, do your homework, make sure you want it, make sure you find a way to take care of yourself, have a plan. You know, even if it don't go according to plan, at least have a plan and, you know, but you can do it. You know, you can do it. You know? So I would like for you all to answer this next question uh, gracefully. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm uh, putting out this disclaimer. Uh, I don't want you all to lose any of your uh, streams of income, <laughs> or the money on your trees that you have taken years to grow. But I also understand too that uh, we are people from Augusta, and as you often see, we're very 
verbose, loquacious, we like to talk, but we also always have something to say. And we're always very aware of what's going on in uh, our industry, but also more so in the world and in society. So as parents and as creative, uh, I'd like to know, what are your thoughts and feelings on the climate of racism, discrimination, and our cultural inclusion in Hollywood? I mean, I'm not gonna lose, I hopefully not, because <laughs> everybody knows that it's a problem. That it's very much a problem. Racism, anti-blackness in our workplaces, um, discrimination in hiring, it's a problem. I mean, there was a whole Twitter viral thing for editors last week. And editors are the most like, in the shadows, in dark rooms, nobody even knows we exist profession. And it's blew up mm. that a black editor reached out on one of the Facebook um, groups about meeting other black union editors. And a lot of the white male editors um, lashed out at him that it was reverse racism and he was doing something illegal by asking for the information of other black editors. and. They should put out ads that say only white men can apply. And um, and it, it, you know, and there are arguments that people say that's just a few people, but I don't, I don't think that. I think that that's just the few that are vocal about it and, and the few that act on it. And there's a lot of people that have, we all have implicit bias, you know? Right, right. He, does it keep an entire race of people from being employed? That's different, you know? So, you know, I I am like a firm believer in diversifying work, like diversifying the candidates that you interview, you know, like mm -hmm. um, uh, opening up the pool of people that you know, like if you only hire the people that you know and all you know right. are people that look just like you, then that's a problem. and. You know, as black artists, we also don't want to just be hired for the black show. Right, right, so right. Just about black people or just just about and slaves. You know, certain, so, yeah, right. just certain a subset a subset of black people because we're not a monolith. So <laughs> right, we're not, and, yeah. and yeah, we want to oh. work on the futuristic world building. Yes, show. you know, we want to. Yeah. We want to work on the 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 eighteenth the seventeenth century drama. You know, like we. Right, right. I love doing. I love watching these things. I want to work on them, and I don't want to just be called for mm -hmm. black stuff. And um, and although too, I also I also feel a, like in my heart, I feel a responsibility to to do black stuff too, because when other people who don't have the experiences that I do. Yes. work on them they turn out differently you know a lot of them the movies the friday the boomerang if black people hadn't done those movies they would not be what they are today they would not be that so it's um, definitely yeah and it there's just a lot there's a lot to talk about there's a lot to process to unpackage and i'm glad that that conversation is getting started I just need for people to take the steps now. Like, like me, I just want to see, I want to see. Do the, things, do the things that you say should be done. Yeah. yeah. That's it. I, I would love, I would love to see more of us behind the scenes. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, at this point, what, in 18 years, I've probably done about 35, 40 national commercials. I've never worked with a, a black director. Mm. That's Not a problem. Never. Not once, no, never. Wow. You know what I'm saying? Look, fortunately, I have worked with two black advertising agencies. So that that only two. I think it's only like two big ones, um, Burrell and, and Matlock out of Atlanta. Um, mm. For me, I just feel like personally, I, I want to be respected as a black actor more. Like, well, I, I can't say for me personally, I want to see black actors more respected. It's not necessarily personal. I mean, I, I usually work, you know, with diverse cast, you know, most of my career is with, you know, multiracial cast. But um, like for me, I feel like casting gets lazy when it comes to black actors sometimes. Mm. It's like, oh, we like this type. He kind of reminds me of, you know, so-and-so rapper. Okay, well, does it get so-and-so rapper? 
and that's fine. And I'm not trying to take a pop check, check out of their pocket. It is what it is. I'm not coming from an angle of like, you know, you're taking something from me. I just noticed a pattern in casting that they seem to do with black actors that they don't necessarily do without white counterparts a lot of times. They do much more stunt casting with us than you usually don't see. You know what I'm saying? Usually they'll tell, they just, I mean, for a lot of times when you're trying to get seen for roles or whatever, and they'll tell you, well, tell your manager, well, we're looking for a name. And then that's who they go with. You know what I'm saying? Or they'll go with someone foreign. And I'm like, okay, if you wanted the name, don't nobody in this country know him. So how did that, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So a lot of times they just always just throw whoever's already got a fame or social media following mm-hmm. in a roles quicker when it's black involved. But a lot of times when you turn on TV or, or go to a movie theater, you're always seeing some white, new white show and white film with somebody you ain't never heard of. So not only is that a new face and that's somebody career, but it also that's also new wealth that they're building within their own community. So, you know, same, we can't keep having the same rich black folks over and over again. Like y'all got to let some new people come in here and get some new wealth. And, you know, that's how you, you keep it going. So I just, cause it's weird. Cause there's been times where I've literally y'all like a lot of people don't know, like there are shows that it's like me and whatever that famous comedian is who they're going to pick from. And usually the time it is, they go with the comedian. I'm not knocking him. What I'm knocking is when I go into the audition room and I nail that. And the first thing out of casting director's mouth is, do you do comedy? You do stand up? Mm. Like what difference do it make? Wasn't I funny? Was I'm a comedic actor? Like I was funny. You laugh. You love me, but mm-hmm. because, but but I mean that, and that's what we have. So it's a lot of things that they do where they keep where they help create these type of rivalries within the business. So it's like unless you're a stand up comedian, it's just hard to get an acting job as as a comedic actor if you're black. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. it's not respected the same way. So it's stuff like that that people don't really talk about that often. That I've noticed that pattern more and more and more. And you know, even with black comedians, even in stand-up, they have their own ways that you see the industry play games in that way, where it's usually only one to two comedians on at a time. Yeah. Like there's only be and then it's that person's turn, then they move on to somebody else. But you know, I, I don't know, it's just weird to me. Like I just would love to be able to go to a movie theater, you know, when you go to the Cineplex and they got 14 screens, that it might be three black films playing at the same yeah. time, not one black film every four months. Theater, right. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? What kind of crap is that? You know? Or but you know, even, like, don't you don't have? They don't have to be black films, Just right? Like, yeah, they for everybody. You know, like, I mean, that's what I mean. What I'm saying, majority. Color, color, you know, like, right. yeah, no, I know, I, and I, I know you, I know you're saying that, is, but you know, that's putting putting our our creative thing in a box. No, there was this myth. There's this thing they would tell us in Hollywood all the time, where you know, black films don't do well overseas. Well, I had a, a problem. I've never accepted that is because for one, black athletes are some of the most recognized athletes in the world. Mm-hmm. Black music is, you know, huge, you know, in Asian countries. Yeah, around the world. Mm-hmm. So you mean to tell me they don't want to see actors? I say, I just don't believe that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But you know, but that, but then you, but then you're talking about media. You're talking about power. You're talking about influence. So it's it's, it's deeper. It's deeper than just just the art at that point. You know what I'm saying? And so that's where we got to realize how powerful this this tool is. This tool that media is that that we have and that that we work in, and because it, it can change, it can change lives. It can change generations. You know, I mean, social media itself is even akin to it. You know. You know, you saw what the TikTokers did with Trump's rally in Tulsa. You know, it's mm-hmm. you know we got we had the Arab Spring, and I I guess you could say this is the you know African American you know ADOS or whatever you're down with Spring here yeah. in this country, and it was all generated you know mm-hmm. you know through art, man. You know, like I said, our job as artists is to show people who they are, where they are, and what condition they're in. So when people always ask me, what's the adage? You know. Does art imitate life or does life imitate art? I'm gonna say every time art imitates life. Just because you wasn't aware of it doesn't mean it didn't exist. Mm-hmm. Because in my travels, I've found that to be the case. <laughs> I have heard and seen some I, things that yeah. I'm like, I can't believe that's real. Yeah. And then it, eventually it'll be in the movie or something. And then people think, oh, see, the movies are influenced. And I'm like, mm. all humans are capable of all behavior. Very true. 
Very true. Uh, I appreciate all the questions coming in from those of you that are watching. Uh, this is the perfect time. I'm going to ask you to uh, type your questions in so I can bring them up in a second because we're about to close up. Um, I just have two more questions for uh, Shannon and Shay, but uh, the questions are great. I can't wait to ask Shannon and Shay these questions and put them up. But if you're still watching and viewing, please type in your questions on YouTube and on Facebook so we can respond to them. So, Shannon Baker Davis, Shay Roundtree, if you had the opportunity to speak with yourself at 18 years old, what things would you say to yourself? Oh, wow. Um, what was that? I'm still going, well, I, you know, when I was 18, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I feel like listen to your parents, maybe. Oh. I mean, like I, you, cause it took, you know, it took, it took a long time for me to be like, well, maybe my parents are smart. <laughs> you know, like that. And, you right. know, and they were all, have always been very, 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 very supportive. And they always, they say, well, Shannon's always been an independent child. So, um, so, but you know, everything that is good about them, I had in me, you know, I just listen, cause you know, I, wanted to go to Northwestern for college and Howard had given me a full scholarship and my dad came in my, I'll never forget. He came in my room and he had his list and he said, these are the pros of Northwestern. These are the cons. These are the pros of, of Howard. These are the cons. And he just laid it out for me. And he was he's like, it's your decision. You know, I truly, I, pretty much knew like they wanted me to go to Howard. So I was probably gonna go to Howard because <laughs> they were like, you're gonna have to take out so many loans to pay for Northwestern. You know, I, they had given me a small scholarship, but not the full thing. And, you know, I cried my whole, almost the whole trip driving up to DC. DC? <laughs> I was upset. I did not want to go to Howard. I did not want to go to Howard, mm. but I had listened to my parents because they said, you know, you, you'll be able to, I, we'll be able to like, maybe buy your car your senior year. We'll be able you to get your husband there. Huh? You met your husband there. I, met, I did. I did. I got Ooh. my MRS degree. Well, yeah. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> um, and I just cried. I cried. I did not want to go. And then this, that first month, they just shower all of the goodness of Howard on the freshman class. Did they? Didn't they? Yes. You just do so much, so many oh, fun the things. Trips. People. My, roommate, my roommate was Shaniqua Harrison from New York. She was from New York. And I was like, I am so country because she was from New York. <laughs> she did this, she knew that. She, they were in the club when they were like 16. And I was like, who are you and how can I get to know you more? So, you know, and it's just, it was, it was, it was, a, I mean, I know we, we talk about Howard all the time, but I would tell my 18 year old self, they might, your parents might have something good to say about That's good. life. That's good. Say, um, man, I've kind of been, you know, I left home when I was 18. So I, you know, I've been listening, you know, if I, real talk, if I had to go back and tell myself something at 18, study finance. Mm. Yeah. Um, I made a lot of money very young. Like, like when I was in the 90s, I was working for the Atlanta Braves. Wow. And I was making, I made pretty good. I mean, but you know, I was only taught checking accounts, savings accounts, don't get no credit cards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, that's, and that's how I lived for a long time. I never, and nobody mm -hmm. ever taught me about the stock market you know, mm -hmm. investing. And so I wasted a lot of money in my youth. Yeah. Like, you know, I'm talking about, I was in the nineties, you know, I was doing, it was like cheesecake factory every day. You know, that's where we went. <laughs> you know, like, Let's go to cheesecake, <laughs> you know? Yeah. TGI Fridays. TGI Fridays in DC. So, but it was eating out all the time. But you get, but see, that's the thing <laughs> about artists that we have to be careful of because we get, we go through training and learning our craft and mm. a lot of times we don't get that aspect of it. Very you know true. And I had no one in my life 
that came and talked to me about it, yeah. even in college. They didn't do, and that was something that I worked and I pushed. I don't know if they're doing it now with it before when I still had a connection with the advisors there. I pushed, I was like, you guys really need to do a business of entertainment class. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Y'all got class for everything, but the business and just how to live. And you know, when I speak of that, that was a lot. Of, and so fortunately, um, my mentor Whitman Mayo, Grady from Sanford and Son, mm -hmm. you know, before I moved to California, he actually talked to me about these things because he was someone who did well from himself. People remember from the old show, but he lived out in Fayetteville near Evander Holyfield. He mm -hmm. had a travel agency at one point. So a lot of things that he told me to do, like he was like, don't buy a new car, you know, go to the Screen Actors Guild. It's a lot of rich old white actors and who got big homes that, you know, rent out their pool house or rent out a room or whatever. You don't have to. So this is what I did. And when I came out here, I was on TV and I'm still driving my 87 Maxima. Um, I'm living with um, Angel Tompkins, who was once on TV Guys, the million dollar model and Ted Lang, who was one of the writers for Magnum P.I. And they like, you know, great people showing me around. But that's what I would tell myself. I would just think about the investments that I would have made when I was young, man. I would be financing my own films right now, but I didn't, I didn't know. But you know, 2020 is, you know, it's high, you know, high side, it's you know, it's always 2020. But so if I could go back, I would definitely say study finance, study the markets, learn those things. So when those opportunities do come where your, you know, your art does begin to pay you, you know, where you're able to do certain things, then, you know, you, you would be smarter for it. But, yeah. Very good. And what projects are you currently working on or what projects are coming down the pipeline for you all? I mean, you know, as actors <laughs> and directors and producers and filmmakers, you can't really announce the projects that you're working on. So, but if, if there's something you're working on, yes. But I guess you can't you can't tell us anything. Well, the production is, is down and everything's gonna start back up in the fall. So yeah. I can't say yet what I would be doing. I'm doing so we hope unless it's the second wave, as they say. Yeah, I'm, I know. Now I'm just like if people would just yeah. wear their masks. Their masks. Like me, I'm I'm yeah. just trying to find ways to stay creative. Like like Shannon said, our industry is shut down and you know, it's days I look at my kids like I'm comfortable. Fortunately, my wife still is working in this, but it's like Man, you know, nothing really planned. But um, so what I've been doing really is just I've been writing more, brainstorming, coming up with, you know, other ideas or other shows, other things I want to pitch, you know, when things open back up. Um, you know, I made a T-shirt. <laughs> so I sold a T-shirt that did pretty well. Um, I did a parody. I did a parody of Malcolm X's famous picture when he's looking out of the window holding the gun. Oh. Um, mm. So it was early on in the pandemic where I did, I recreated the same picture, but I'm holding a can of like disinfectant instead of a gun and looking out the window. But I chose to uh, recreate that particular photo. And it's funny when I did it, and I told my wife about it, the reason why I did it, I was like, we're fighting this pandemic, but we're still fighting racism at the same time. And when I created the picture and when I put the shirt out there, it was before the George Floyd thing. So mm -hmm. now it has it resonates even more, but it was just something that I was just feeling because so many African Americans have been dying from this disease that it's just like you know if it's not the KKK killing us, it's this, and it's even and this is killing us because of systematic racism. So that's that's what that's what inspired that photo. So one of my um, one of my friends, he's a writer director. He was like, man, that's a great photo. You ought to put it on a shirt. So I put it on a t-shirt and it did pretty well. So, you know, I thank people for, buy, you know, buy, buy my shirt. So again, like you were saying, just finding other ways to be creative and to stay doing something. But I, I've actually been enjoying the time just reading books, um, you know, getting better at photography, you know, um, watching more movies. I just been, you know, enhancing who I am as a person, as a craft. So once things open back up, I have even more to bring to the table. You know? Got it. So she, I know you said that you can't really speak to uh, this coming question uh, based on your experiences because things have changed. It's not the same mm -hmm. time that it was when you and Shannon were first moving from the East Coast to the West Coast going to LA. But Brian Anthony Smith has this question for both of you. Where is a good place to start your career as a writer, director, producer? I like to say, so during COVID-19, during the summer, while some people are still waiting for their towns, their cities, their areas to open up, what can people do? Uh, what's a good direction or where would you like to point them 
uh, and starting their career as writers, producers, uh, filmmakers, editors, all those types of things. At home, you start at home. <laughs> yes. Like if you got something that you wrote, write something else. Um, a lot of times I've seen people get opportunities and they, they got all their eggs thinking that one script is the greatest thing since sliced bread and it might get you in the door. And then I've watched the same managers or agents be like, okay, now show me what else you got. And then they have nothing. So, you know, so if you want to be a writer, write, 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 write. And when you got writer's block on something else, write, write, write. Because for one, if you're going to go out there and shop yourself around or pitch yourself, you got to have something to pitch and you got to have content. Very you know true. what I'm saying? Um, if, if you're an actor, act, act, act as much as possible. You know, I mean, now, like like Shannon was saying earlier, you, we got social media. You got people doing all kind of things that this the um, platforms, TikTok or whatever, are giving you opportunities that you know we didn't have before. Like there was no social media when I came up. You literally had to beat the pavement and beat the streets, like literally sleep outside the Alliance Theater door, hoping Kenny Leon to see you on the way in. Be like, yo, can I just audition, <laughs> you know? But now you got, com I got, I know comedians and actors who've been discovered off social media. You know, they've had That's huge true. social media followers and, you know. Musicians. Now they, yeah. You know, so, so that's, so that's what I'm saying. At home is the best place. The little, the young boy that's saying, I can't breathe. Mm -hmm. uh, he got, a, I think a record contract from Warner Brothers, I believe. Oh, good. Wow. That thing, yeah. After yeah. the George Floyd, uh, yeah, incident, yeah. So, yeah, you're right. Social media now, right from your own home. Yeah. So every home, like people, like you know, I got my office upstairs. I've turned into a mini studio. I got one wall is a green screen. I got the my, you know, I got equipment. You know, I can do kind of whatever I want. You know, um, research. You know, you got the computer. You know, when you watch these movies, pay attention to the credits. See who the executive producer is, the associate producer, the cast and director. Um, you know, follow them on social media if they if they're, if they're public. You know, you know what I'm saying. You know, reach out. You'd be surprised how many people actually do interact with fans of people trying to get into business. And don't be deterred if you don't get a response or you get a no. You right. can't be deterred by that at all. I would tell you an example. I remember one of my first auditions was for Dawson's Creek. And I drove six hours from Atlanta, Georgia to Wilmington, North Carolina, audition for like 10 minutes, then got in my car and drove six hours back to um, Atlanta because I had class the next day. Hmm. I'm in class and then leave class. I go to rehearsal for the school play. Then my agent would text me and be like, yo, they you got a call back for Dawson's Creek. And I would get in my car after rehearsal and drive all night back to Wilmington, North Carolina, six hours in the middle of the night to be there at 10 a.m. in the morning, audition again for the callback and then go back to Atlanta and then not get the part. I did that sometimes three, four times a month. Wow. So when people want to, so that's why I'm like a person when I'm like, so what have you been doing? What are you doing? I'm like, it's a certain level of dedication that people have and that when they make it. And, it's, and, and, and you know, you might not always make it. You might not become the Michael Jordan of your particular field, but it's the same type of tenacity and stories that you can find through anybody um, who's willing to succeed. And that's that being relentless, that, that tenacity and, you know, not accepting no for an answer. Like, I just don't accept no. I was like, you know, at Clark Atlanta University, the other university, <laughs> our motto, you know, find a mail, we'll find a way or make one. And, you know, I, I, and that's, that's, that's what we do. And so, um, you know, but that's what you got to do. You, so it's like you do your research, you know, go on AFI's website, check out some of these master classes people are, are doing online. Now. Like it's, people are able to get access to some of the greats actually doing master classes yeah. that you could never get. A generation ago for it's low like rates. take for low rates and take advantage of that type of stuff man it's free it's free People yeah have so many free get, zooms. get on get on YouTube. youtube find somebody who has a career that you admire study what they did you know what i'm saying study what they're doing you know that's 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 what you got to do but a lot of your work starts at home like i would tell people people like how did i get here walking the track at fort gordon every day then going to barnes and nobles and copying all the information i could out of the acting books because i couldn't afford to buy them at the time yeah so it's like you can't make excuses you know yeah. very yeah. good i also say mm -hmm. i was mm -hmm. i was told by one of my mentors troy takaki who cut hitch mm -hmm. which I mm -hmm. love. Oh. um he said he always says, 
network with your people that you know, like network mm -hmm. on your level. Don't always think that you need to like that, yeah. out to people who are super successful. You, The people that you know that are on your same level, that have the same drive that you do, mm -hmm. they're going to go up and they're hopefully going to take you with them. So you have to know. Yeah. Because sometimes your trajectory isn't, you know, I always say funny, like the old space shuttle. The space, the space shuttle had a, a couple of rocket boosters. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't right. like, you know, it, it, it's valuing your friendships. I know I'm going to be okay regardless because I got friends that's going to be okay. You know what I'm saying? We make sure right. each other is going to be okay. Yeah. You know, I got I got friends, you know, they get opportunities. They like, yo, if I get this show, you know, like I literally, man, I one of my dope best friends, man, like had a TV show. It was a character for one of his best friends. He was like, made a phone call. They brought me in. They loved me. The show didn't go. It didn't last. But it's like that's, I mean, value yeah. those friendships, man. And it, it's not just you. That student film, that that director that you work with, you know, who was just trying to finish their thesis, might end up getting the next big deal. And it was like, yo, go and get right. everybody that I worked with back then. I was fortunate enough to be able to call somebody, Spike Lee, somebody I'm cool. I worked with Spike Lee on two occasions. And, mm -hmm. you know, and it, it was the first, the first time I auditioned for him, when he looked at my resume, he saw that I went to Clark Atlanta University and he asked me if these two professors were still there. And we immediately started. Wow. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, you know, he's somebody that I worked with that I just had loved being on his set because that was the only time I've ever been on a set. And almost every role that you could think of on a film set was filled by African-American. Wonderful. You know, and so, you know, I just want to, continue and hopefully I'm just at that level where I can give back and, and just do greater things, man. I just want to tell beautiful stories, man, and just 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 create good art and entertainment and give people, you know, you know, hopes and 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 you know and ambitions to, to want to do more and to, and to realize their value as human beings, man. Because I think we've gotten so much we got so caught up in the world and everything is either how much money you have or what your political affiliation or what you know uh, social group you're a member of that you know we, we compartmentalize people and then we, we strip people of their humanity and then we created this thing we call cancel culture. Yeah. And it's like, you know, I'm a Christian and I'm like, I can't be a Christian and believe in cancel culture. Like that don't even make sense. That's that's a strict start contradictory with the foundation of everything that we're supposed to believe in but a lot of that is because we've lost you know that relationship with our own humanity and a lot of times we should educate people instead of right. always canceling them because yeah. all that be flipped back on you because right, next right. Week, something else yeah right. but you got to think that whole the canceling thing the reason why I, it's, it's scary is because it's always based on whatever the latest fashion is so exactly. when 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 the temperature they change up. or 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 the or or whatever if some type of propaganda becomes popular and people buy into it the next thing you know you're the thing that's wrong and you got it's like we can't we got to be careful about that that's like right. even when this country and it's like you know we got you know freedom of religion and some of the tenets of the things that America was founded on i understand why the founding fathers made those things and it, it wasn't perfect the nation's not perfect you know what i'm saying but the ideals or what we should be striving for is supposed to correct those things. And if we, we we focus on that, I think we'll be all right, you know? Right, the aesthetic and the principle, it's just like the end of the whiz. Mm -hmm. The color right. is great. And then everybody, right. everything else, the color, in fashion, orange is the new yeah. black, nothing against the show. But you know, black, you know, everybody dye your hair gray, everybody wear contact, mm -hmm. everybody go back to glasses, you know, mm -hmm. loop earrings, no earrings, you know, uh, so, yeah. everything constantly changes. Yeah. You know, and it's and it gets dangerous, and it gets dangerous when you start in a political and a, in a in a um in in other areas because that goes like how it used to be back in Europe back in the day. You know, when it was okay, it was fashionable to be a Protestant. Then it was like, oh no, Catholicism's back in charge, and it's like we're gonna kill all of you guys. That's the extreme of the spectrum, but you know, that's the, right. That's true, and and you know, there's a lot of that happening now in New York, uh, and on the East Coast in music. Uh, in classical music, uh, particularly mm -hmm. in opera. And uh, I, this next question is a very interesting question. It is a question that comes sometimes in opera, because uh, mm -hmm. people say that in opera, some people should not take the role of being in Porgy and Bess by George mm -hmm. Gershwin. Because it, it's something you mentioned earlier, Shannon, it sort of, uh, it sets people uh, in an era, you know, Catfish Row, down south, we are Southerners. Uh, and, you know, a lot of times the, the productions are the the creative uh, presentations deal with black people in slavery. Those stories need to be told. 
look what's happening now with syrup. Probably, mm -hmm. I don't know, in another few days it'll change. But now something that everybody loved, uh, you know, there was Mrs. Buttersworth now, but then, you know, Aunt Jemima, and that'll probably be very uh, politically incorrect for me to even speak on or say <laughs> uh, in a week or two weeks, you know, just now that I think the AP has decided that black should be capitalized, and I always capitalize black. I did right, me too. Black. You know, but, okay. You know, <laughs> we have the Urban Dictionary, people are saying things, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, now the syrup has to be changed, you know, uh, but then in Tom and Jerry, uh, the cartoon, there's a lot of stuff in there that's very similar. You I'm know, against all of that censorship. I'm you know? against all of it. So this next question, uh, mm -hmm. this comes from an opera uh, singer, Philip Harris. How do you make a decision to know whether or not to take the, quote, black role, end quote? And that can be in television, that can be in film. Uh, you know, how do you, what is, what is your uh, compass or when do you determine you know, well, I'm not going to take this black role. Um, well, I look at everything. There's, there's, there's a few principles that I, I look at every before I get to the black part. It's um, um, how much money is it going to pay me? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And if and if there's no money involved, what kind of billing or promotion I'm gonna get from it? Name recognition. Yep. So if it's no, it's no billing. Do I have a love? for whatever the project or the PC is. Mm -hmm. So if it's none of those three, then I don't do it. I don't care what it is. And if mm -hmm. it's one of them, then you know I'll, I'll, I'll consider doing it. And then, so now, depending on what the particular role is for me, is how it makes me feel. Can it be something that I could do in a way that I'm proud of, you know? I don't, I don't like this whole censorship thing and want to erase the past. I think it should be put in context. You know what I'm saying? I think it should be put in context. Like when um, Disney Plus started, and they wanted to go take some of the old Song of the South. They wanted to edit that out, edit some of the racist scenes or some of the old cartoons. I think it's important to keep art that's a reflection of that time as a mirror to look, a time machine to look at what ha what can happen and what was. Because we always say, if you don't learn from the past, you're bound to repeat it. So if we keep erasing these things or canceling these things, maybe not us because we're alive and we have these memories. Three, four generations from now, when we're not here and these stories haven't been told and these people don't have the history to go back, then they'll end up like us being slaves to whoever controls who's ever telling their version of his story of what a time was supposed to be. And we end up completing the same cycles. Why do you think we got all these archaeologists and over people digging up all the earth all over everywhere trying to find things? You remember when they, you know, the Dead Sea Scrolls or, you know, a lot of, you know, writings from the era of, of Jesus' time were burned and, and hidden. And so now, you know, society is left ignorant of its past and it, it makes it difficult to go on towards the future. So I don't I, I, I'm really I'm really I really makes me nervous, especially with art. Because like I say, it's 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 a reflection of an era of a time that was real. Mm -hmm. And so in order, if you erase it, you're mm -hmm. disrespecting the people that had to live through that time because that was their story. That's good. You know what I'm saying? Good. That's good. And I, I'm passionate about that as an artist because, you know, like, you know, let's just say 20 years from now that people decide, well, we don't want music with explicit lyrics no more. So all of hip hop be disintegrated. Right because they use certain language because that's a very real thing if it's a slippery slope you but know like, what i'm saying every few years language certain changes you know sometimes mm -hmm. when i go to london if i say arse they say no no no, don't say that right In America, that's not offensive but mm -hmm. if i go there and say ass they don't think anything of it <laughs> right right, they right. Ask you're in america depending if you're speaking about an ass like a donkey or you're calling someone an ass then people get offended so with language ignorance is really what uh, creates a structure uh, and uh, the type of rubric where people censor language and they make a face or as a child, they mm -hmm. oh, don't say that. But I, know. I did like what HBO said, because, you know, with removing Gone from the Wind from HBO Max, that they're actually going to bring it back. But when it comes back, there's going to be like a, a prologue or something in the beginning that basically puts it in context. Like, that's what I'm saying. I'm all for keeping it, but put it in context. Right. You know what I'm saying? I don't understand what the it's issue good. is gone with the 
these I woke mean, folks. I, I, I know people are saying, oh, Stop it's torture. stereotypes mm-hmm. and tropes and stuff that they, I, I just, I don't know. I mean, when you, when I went to film school, we watched Birth of a Nation and it is held up as this Mm -hmm. is cinema. This was cinema during that time. Mm -hmm. Now we all know that Birth of a Nation is about the guy who started the Ku Klux Klan. And we all know that I would hope that, you know, he was one of the original, you know, (laughs) people Mm -hmm. that you don't look up to, that you should not look up to. Um, So, but I just, I don't, I, I don't understand. It, I think well, it, I think it's a limit. I think it's a there's a a a, a bad trend that being knowledgeable and intellectual is bad, mm-hmm. and I think that that's a problem too. I think mm-hmm. that oh much so much so that, yeah. you know like being called an elitist because mm-hmm. you know things and you are knowledgeable about things. That to me is a huge problem and knowing and having seen Gone with the Wind and, you know, or have, or know, or knowing what Birth of a Nation is. And some people just don't know because mm-hmm. there's an idea that mm-hmm. it, it's bad. So right. I don't have to know about it. You know? But it, it's, it, it's hypocritical. It's hypocritical. And, it, I, and I, you know, it is, mm-hmm. yeah, you, I think, as an artist, you should know about these things. You should know right. the context that they're in. You should know who Hattie McDaniel is. You should know why. Right. She should know what happened to her when she right. kept her her Oscar. What happened to her? What she never right. she never did a role like that. Well, after right. that, like she didn't want to do that role anymore, and they would not give her anything else. So right. that all part of that history of Gone with the Wind that people should know. You know, people should know that. The first black director was not somebody in the '60s. It was mm-hmm. Oscar Micheaux. Michelle. Michelle. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, you know, he had like, his own studio. He yeah. had his own studio. He did stories about black people in the mm-hmm. 19th century. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I just I think people just and like, like yeah, and you know, I'm saying as crea- as creatives, it, it's scary because you know you don't want to get to that point to where you're trying to. You're creating something, and it more like you know people want to make it go away just because now they have a new philosophy. That's very scary. Yeah. That's very scary. Yeah. You know, it is. It is. This, this, is, this is good. While wow, we're we're way over time, but this is good. Um, <laughs> I just want to shout out from Augusta, Georgia, Butterfly McQueen, who lived in my neighborhood. Yes, also, mm-hmm. and I believe her role with Sissy and and and, and um um Anna um. Oh, yeah. The second woman to play Aunt Jemima, she grew yeah. up in Richmond County. Yeah, she exactly. also grew up in Richmond County. Danny so Glover. Actually, actually, her and her daughter, who's the modern face, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. They live in the gutter. I mean, what yeah. if people decided the color purple shouldn't be shown uh, anywhere? Exactly. It's got, all, it's got all of that. It's got it makes yeah. Danny Glover plays it, it, the most yeah. hateable person in in a movie that I've seen. Mm-hmm. But he was an actor. It was it's a but, great but see the, the thing about it and the reason why I, triumph, you know. And the thing about it, because the thing about what's scary also, it's scary as an artist, but it's also scary as as a member of society because usually when people start to erase those kind of things at art, they try to act like they don't exist in society. And because mm-hmm. we won't be reminded of it. That's what I'm saying. That's why people want to know why people want to make America great again, because they grew up at a time when media gave them a false sense of what America was. Yeah. America was there's never this real leave it to Beaver Town and, you know, Nick at Night, those shows that we used to watch. Don't get it twisted. People live like that publicly, but behind closed doors, they were still drinking, doing drugs, beating their wives you know, raping, all that stuff was still going on, but nobody turned a blind eye. You could hide it because people were made to feel like that wasn't real because they was caught up in this fantasy that was on TV. But now we don't live, we won't let people forget that fantasy. And that's why I'm real passionate about, you know, we got to fight to protect, you know, art in the context of its time. Now don't come to me today trying to make some shit with blackface in it. You know, there's no need for that. We ain't in that time period no more. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, unless it's a period piece or whatever, then that's different. But let stuff exist from the time so we can have a, a, a we can remember what it was like so we don't repeat the same mistakes and we can grow. Definitely. Know? And speaking about Augusta, one of our friends from Augusta, uh, I believe you did a stopover. They said earlier when you were uh, going to L.A., uh, yeah. Deanna McKinley Bindaw. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Deanna. 
and she's in Texas now. Her question is, what's the biggest risk you've taken that paid off the most? I'll go. Okay. Last year, I was home with a baby and um, second baby and the photograph was getting started up and they said, we're going to we're going to go, but we're going to edit in New York. And I was mm. like, oh, OK, um, how am I going to make this work? Because I had a three month old baby, had a four year old at the time, a husband that works and lives here. And I we and I looked at I remember the day the call came that they think they're going to hire. They're going to hire you. And I looked at Derek. Oh, we were going through a whole thing about hiring me. And I looked at Derek and I said, if I get this, I have to do it. Like, if mm -hmm. I get this, I can't say, oh, no, I changed my mind. I can't. I don't want to do it. We have to go. And oh gosh, the kids. <laughs> so anyway, and That's so fine. picked up. Harlem wasn't even three months. Picked up, went to New York, cut the movie. And it's it was the best experience. The best, I'm so glad I did it. But that's, it was anyway, wow. you're home, and you're like, how do I do this? You just day by day, day by day. Oh, and yeah. you know, like when I looked at my husband, and I said, "Are we going to do this?" He said, "You have to do it. You have to." So, wow, wow, that's um, awesome. Say, what about you? What's the biggest risk you've taken that paid off the most? Um, dropping out of college my senior year and driving cross country in a raggedy car to California, not knowing nobody. <laughs> Yep. I had a two, I had a two thousand I had a uh, nineteen eighty seven Nissan Maxima with two hundred and fifty eight thousand miles on it, an oh, oil wow. leak, and a bent valve with no air condition, and I drove from Georgia to Los Angeles in the middle of summer, and went to stay with some white people I did not know. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know nobody, literally. And so that that was the big that was the biggest gamble. I, my whole life was, you know, I bet I bet it, I put everything on that. That was all chips in for me. Yeah. Wow. From one of my family members, uh, B Brown, uh, she uh, directs all of the the plays in uh, the theater uh, stuff at Good Shepherd Baptist Church, and mm. uh, she said for Shay, B B at the actress, you know, B Brown, mm. for Shay, what are some of the works you've done with Kenny Leon? Um, I actually um, never worked um, with Ken and Leon in an actual production um, beyond um, some scene work at the Alliance. Um, when I mentioned Kenny Leon, it's because at the time when I was living in Atlanta, he was the artistic director of the uh, um, Alliance Theater, which means he was basically in charge. So who got hired, who got fired, who worked or not in the city kind of went through him. And like I said, at that particular time, his wife was my mentor and professor. So um, I would audition every time they would have open auditions at the Alliance. And um, one of the first gigs that I did work for, he didn't direct it, but I did The Hobbit at the Alliance. <laughs> I've done so many kind of different things. Wow. And um, and so and, and so then outside of that, and him coming over to Clark Atlanta University, which is also his alma mater, the other university. Um, <laughs> I was had a chance to to work and get to know him over the years, and um, with him, um, also the likes of Pedro Harris, um, if you if you're in, if you're into the theater world, and um, but um, he has True Colors in Atlanta now, but he's a great guy, phenomenal person. Wow. So that. Well, two more questions because we have to end it, uh, and this next question is from Jazariah. I believe that's the way to say it. What is the best way to audition for a movie? Or a play, uh, I think you can look at things like, uh, is it called Playbill? Are there some other websites they can go to? A Playbill, um, you can go through there. Um, I'm not sure there for plays anymore, but for film and TV, the best, it depends on what you want to do. You know, they're, they're extras, they're, you know, people got a couple lines. Then there's like the supporting cast and they're like leading roles. Like it depends on what you want to do in the business. You have to really know where you see yourself. And for if you want to be a star, if you want to speak in roles, you need an agent and a manager or a manager, one of the two. 
Um, the best way to find that, you can go on the Screen Actors Guild's website and you can find a list of agents um, that's in your city or nearby. Um, and you submit headshots, um, pictures. Um, if you got any video, if you're doing any plays, any performances, you can submit, submit that too. And you will find somebody that would want to represent you because that's how you get seen by the cast and directors who will put you in front of the people that make the decisions on those type of roles. Anything other than that, you will never get that opportunity. So you it will be most likely to be like, if you just see something like in Augusta Chronicle, Hey, come be in a new movie. They shooting here in Augusta, call this number nine out of 10 times. That's usually for a role as an extra. That's not saying that they might not like you on set and somebody like, Hey, you, you know what? You gonna have a speaking line. That's possible, but that's rare. You know? And a last question for Shannon from Brian Anthony Smith. Should editors get certified on editing software like Avid, Premiere Pro, or Final Cut? Um, I don't think you need to get certified necessarily. I think Av Avid, I don't think, but I know Avid is the industry standard. Um, but there are um, indie, indie projects being cut on Premiere. Final Cut, not so much anymore, but uh, learn all of them. I know all of them, you know, like if some job comes along and they're like, oh, and we're cutting on Premiere, I don't want to be like, ah, now I can't do it. So, um, yeah, but Avid is the industry standard. So if you don't know Avid, it'll be hard to work on scripted television and unscripted too. And well, one more thing, if for especially for anybody looking to be an actor or whatever, um, one thing now that's more commonplace now than when I got into the business is um, actors creating their own content. Yeah. You know, Very write, true. direct, if you do improv, yeah. whatever, you know, um, definitely that's, that's, that's the model now, you know what I'm saying? So, um, I, so I'm, I'm in that part of the game now, just like all the newbies, like, you know, it's funny. I, sometimes I, I'm young, especially with a lot of my friends my age, but I started in the business you know, about a decade, most of them, most of my friends. So it's like, it's kind of weird, but, um, but that's one of the differences now that, you know, a lot of artists are creating their own content. So you definitely want to look into that. Um, this has been a phenomenal session. I just want to point out two comments. Uh, Tanya Bell said, Hey guys, great session. Would love to hear about any dream projects and our collaborations, music, editing, acting, all of it keeps shining. And then also Shallon Brown Johnson, who went to Davidson with us, Said no question, but I want to thank you, Damien, for having this session and for Shannon and Shay sharing their experiences with us. So before we sign off, I would like to uh, do this next part that I always do at the end of an episode. I'd like to announce who's going to be my special guest for the next episode, which will be episode number six. And I'm super excited. I'm not sure if Tanya is still on, but I think she'll be excited about this. And Karen Gordon should be a little excited about this as well, because the next group of people coming on is going to be called oh, uh, why class? Masterminds, Jazz and yeah. the, uh, Camille Thurman, who's a phenomenal, phenomenal musician, uh, saxophonist, vocalist, loudest, arranger, multi instrumentalist. He performs the Jazz Lincoln Center Orchestra. And also my big brother, who's really responsible for introducing me to Winton, and uh, being a, a, a mentor to me, uh, Tanya Bell's older brother and uh, Karen Gordon, I'm not sure if, which one of you are older, but Wycliffe <laughs> Gordon, a multi instrumentalist he plays every instrument possible. He sings, producer, record label. He's actually the one that uh, pushed me to produce my first project and actually put up money for me to create introspections live. <laughs> He's an arranger and a vocalist. He also has performed with Jazz Lincoln Center Orchestra with Winton and Winton Septet. Uh, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you all so much for your time. We were way over, so please tell your. I know. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, I feel like we I were just it. sitting I, in a restaurant talking and all this. But this, this is what we do when we get together. This, this and, is what and, we do, y'all. Everybody and, got and, to just and, hear and, our and, a shame, and a shameless plug: go <laughs> on Amazon Prime and check out a movie I did about ooh, wow, 13 years ago. No, 16 years ago. Is that right? Yeah. And um, it's called the LA Riot Spectacular. And it's about everything that's going on right here now. Really? It's, yeah. Every it it it, it um it's a pair, it's a satire over the um, Rotten 92, you know, Rodney King Riots. Mm -hmm. But uh it's 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 a equal opportunity offender if you can get past that. 
and really pay attention to the themes and the things that we're highlighting in the in the film is so relevant to today. But it's on Amazon Prime. It's called the L.A. Riot Spectacular. Okay. Wow. I didn't even know that. I don't. I don't know why I knew, didn't know. The L.A. Riot Spectacular, and it's on what? Amazon Prime. Amazon Prime. Wow. So the last thing I always do is I ask each guest to let people know how they can get in touch with them. Uh, that's it, LA Riot Spectacular on Amazon Prime. Check that out. I'm gonna go download it tonight. Uh, Shannon, Shay, how can they reach you? Like social media, because I'm sure a lot of people want to ask questions. They want to come. <laughs> they want like they want the whole. I don't you know. Know my social media. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> media, phone my, number, email, whatever. No, my t- <laughs> here. My cell phone number is no. Um, my Twitter is Shannon underscore B underscore Davis. Um, my Instagram is Shannon Baker Davis. Um, yeah, that's it. I mean, I don't, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm big star or whatever. So yeah, girl, you understand, listen, you are the future. Hey, listen, I tell everybody I know, I was like, look, it's more work behind the camera than it is in front of the camera. <laughs> you know, it is, you know, I'm like, I, I mean, I also, I also want to say to people like, you don't have to necessarily be an actor, producer, writer, director. There's like, not even just editing. If you like clothes, there's costume design. If you like awesome. interior design, there's production. Lighting. There's set lighting, cinematographers. If you like taking photographs, there. if you like numbers, you can be in a production accountant, you know? If you like bossing people advisor. around, you can work at a studio. You know, like, there's just if so you, many- If you got a good memory and you remember um continuity like you know something you always noticing something's not right from one shot yeah. to the next that's there's a script supervisor there's, mm. there's all that's different cool. roles in the film industry and you don't have to limit yourself to if you don't make it as an actor oh i just can't do anything in film i need to just go you know work at burger king you know so try to <laughs> try to find something else that you can do that have you <laughs> And yeah. I mean, it's like one of my first. King. There's nothing wrong with that. Central workers, I love them. I love Burger King. Hey, one of my <laughs> first acting jobs when I lived in Atlanta, I did a I did a training video for Burger King employees. <laughs> I don't done it all. Like that was the best. Like two thousand dollars I made in like ninety six. <laughs> I was like, really, y'all paying me this much? Listen, a lot of people would love two thousand dollars now. They didn't get those stimulus checks. Oh, I, know. <laughs> I know, right? I know. But um, y'all can reach me on Instagram. At Shay underscore Roundtree, um, my Twitter is at Shay Roundtree or um, Shay Roundtree at um, at Gmail. Yes, you all can reach out to them on Instagram. I think now uh, Shay and Shannon are going to be checking all of their inboxes. <laughs> they will check. Oh, they will I'll check. Get, listen. I have emailed people who who sent me a message like three and four years ago, and I said, "Listen, yeah. I'm still a little late." Yeah, because you're a lot of people. I have a lot. I get a lot of mail, so it ain't, it's not me trying to be. You know, it's just sometimes like it, it's a job just sifting through it. You right. Know? Well, listen. I can't thank you all enough for your time, your energy, your talent, your experience, uh, experiences collectively. I mean, uh, both of you are definitely celebrities. You're great people. Honestly, I'm honored to to, to know you. I'm blessed that. Uh, God allowed my path to start out with two wonderful people such as yourselves. Um, you know, and I've been blessed to work with a lot of great people and you all are, are on the same level of those great people. And I look forward to seeing you continue to shine in everything that you do. Uh, I do look forward to collaborations, but uh, I'm just looking forward to coming back to the West Coast to hang. Uh, man, we, we look forward to having you, man. My Christmas tour got canceled uh, due to COVID-19. because It was going to be in California, but It'll happen later. Uh, I'll wear a mask and still come out there. Thank you <laughs> to everyone that watched on all the platforms. Share it. You can watch it again. Uh, we have a lot of uh, college administrators and educators watching as well. I know that both of you are going to be invited to do online trainings other places. Uh, you know, it's, it's just good to see two people again that are down to earth, that are family people, uh, but you're very much uh, on the cutting edge of what's going on in your industry. Thank you so much. And everybody tune in next week with Camille Thurman and Wycliffe Gordon. They are both amazing. Uh, Thanks. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for having me. Take care.
Thank you.